So I've got a song for y'all tonight. Because I really, know, I, I don't know, am I going to sing or not? Um, it, I One I grew up with, right? Like Burl Ives sang it. It's about a fox. So the fox went out one chilly night, pray, prayed for the moon to give him light. Many a mile ago that night before. Oh, he's going to eat some chickens. Oh, my goodness. So what do we do with these stories, right? If, if you're on the fox's side of the story, Kilts has some words for you. With her rooster, her new rooster. And we need to figure out whose side we're on when we tell our stories. Welcome to the Mosaic Ark. You're mad at me, aren't you're you? Mocking, you're mocking the death of my monarchy, uh, basically. It's a song. What are you going to do? How? You're going to sing it with me? Because we need to sing this song. I I had, I had uh, like a terrible emotional pain this week. The first thing you do is you come into the stream, start singing about foxes. I'm going to try again. So the fox went out one chilly night, prayed, but no, I can't. I, you're so lucky I can't carry the tune. You know, he, he gets the gray goose and flings it over his back and goes off and feeds it to his little kitties. Chomp, chomp, chomp. And they all nod on the bones. Oh, bones. Oh, bones. So oh. do you think I can trigger her? <laughs> no, <I> <laughs> it's really not fun. I had to bury them all in a mass grave. I'm going to cry again. They were rope speared <laughs> by a fox. They were. They were. They were. Mr. Fox. All the Wes Anderson fandom is curious now. What did Mr. Fox do? <clears throat> Maybe you should tell the story. I'm having flashbacks. That'll make the story really pointy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I came out. What day was it? I forget what day. Horror. Was. The horror of the day. I don't. It, what day was it? <sighs> Maybe it was almost the a day week of ago. Sorrow. Yeah, day of sorrow. It was, yeah, it was a few days ago. So I walked out into my yard and uh, bodies was everywhere. Mm, I found the the lifeless body of my favorite chicken, Bandit the pirate, on the floor on the ground, and then realized that there were a lot of piles of feathers everywhere. No, including the fe feathers of her husband, Rooster. Uh, uh, so I kept wandering around my yard and finding more bodies, headless bodies of chickens. And then I found Elvis Presley, lifeless by an olive tree. He, so, he sang um, for us last week. He did. He's been singing for us every, every, every stream uh, very enthusiastically uh, in defiance of the war on roosterdom. Uh, unfortunately, he will not be singing ever again. <laughs> oh, but I have the um, song about the fox. Right. Wait. That seems a little tasteless. Yes. Yeah. I can't make you mad at me because you're too happy to be on this no, stream. I'm too happy to see you. <laughs> but, no, but the thing is, that's the problem. It's like, oh, yeah. Come on, George, act. We need to act this up, She's right? Because yeah, yeah. this is oh. actually pertinent to our theme tonight. Just whose side of the story do you take and which story are you telling and which ones are true, right? Yes. There is a, there is well, a high intellectual purpose to this horrible singing that I'm not doing. 
<laughs> it's not horrible. It's cute. Mm. Um, it was actually one of my favorite I, songs growing up. It was a Burl Live song. And then when we were talking about it, I found some, there's, you know, good YouTube performances and, and the women who did it right there in lace and they got a fiddle and they're doing all this, you know, <gasps> you know, with the, the, the acting of the song and stuff. It's like, no, these foxes are killers. They, they murder, yeah. they murder hens and their gallant, their gallant Chanticleers who would, who would defend them against horrible. I, it's pretty horrible to realize what those foxes did. I presume one fox. I think it was just the one fox because they they are very um, methodical about how they kill Ugh. flocks, and they just take the heads and then they leave the bodies. I think they take the heads and drink the blood and then leave the bodies. They leave the carcasses behind, so they don't even eat the bird, which makes it doubly traumatizing. Because I just had to pick up my headless chickens. Um, I'm yeah. not sure we can tell the fox's story sympathetically anymore we're just gonna have to be on team chicken well isn't that interesting that you know uh, i was thinking about it after this uh very traumatic memory that you've just activated <laughs> hey i'm trying to get you I, hey there's more to come on this stream <laughs> um we're gonna do arianism you ready oh, oh <laughs> i should have poured myself a tequila gonna, hey we hey we are we, uh, we aim to trigger uh, pretty much everybody tonight. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm starting with kills. Well, I'll, go, I'll go first <laughs> for everybody. Um, <laughs> so, um, basically, I have eaten chicken twice since finding my dead flock, which was funny because, you know, you're sitting there grieving birds that you're actually eating. So, I, you know, the irony is not lost mm. on me. But... Um, it's a kind of, uh, it was a moment of considering, well, he had, he, he had many foxes to feed, uh, which just happened to be needing my chickens, which I also eat, except I didn't want to eat those chickens because they were my pet chickens. Mm -hmm. um, then thinking about, you know, um, <laughs> turning the foxes into fur coats. <laughs> Uh, everyone who's arguing about wearing fur now, I don't think you've ever had to bury a flock of birds in a mass grave. So, I mean, I'm very pro fox fur after this week. <laughs> we're um, we're going to get you that stole for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah. a big dead fox. <laughs> but the thing, the fox shouldn't be there at all. Mind you, the chicken shouldn't be there either because I, I as I think I understand chicken, yes. chickens as a species, I think they're, they're jungle birds and they come from India. So we think of them as sort of classically, you know, farm Europe kind of birds. And yet they come from India. And then the fox shouldn't be in Australia. No. Because it came over to be hunted no. by the English. No, wait. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my my trauma is like a little <laughs> a little story of uh, import-export, global <laughs> import-export of species. <laughs> <laughs> and who, no, who, belongs, be who belongs where in the story? Because let's see, they're all immigrants. No, wait. Yes. <laughs> My convict chickens versus the British fox. Um, yeah. Uh, no, none of these things should be here. So uh, maybe maybe Australia is just reclaiming its own, <laughs> its own sovereignty from all the imported species. Um, well, I would accept that if Koala yeah. got them or something, right? Or maybe a wombat. Uh, I think wombats are vegetarians. Oh, all right, no wombat, no wombat yeah. murderers. We had, we had our, we had our. Your wombat uh, got your car them. though last summer. Yeah, they they won't take out a chicken. They take out a car. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they're mighty hunters of the machines. There are mass graves in Australia, of course, that have been taken out by wombats. <laughs> Including yours. Right? Everybody's worried about the snakes and the spiders here. It's like, no, nah, mate. It's those little grass-chewing concrete behemoths that you've got to... <laughs> and, the, and, the, and, and koala bears, are the I, they're not cuddly little... That one, I've held one once, once. Mm. They, they gave us a vest and, like, you know, leaves to feed it and stuff. They're, they're like, dense, right? They're really heavy. Mm. Yeah, they're heavy and stoned. 
<laughs> stoned on their eucalyptus. <laughs> And, the, and then the kangaroos beat up oh. on people. They're like, you know, alligators with fur or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They look like gym bros. <laughs> that are under, <laughs> like in the middle of roid rage. <laughs> I found it. Oh, wow. I forgot to tell you this. Okay. So here's another thing that I found headless. Oh, more. The last, the There's last more. Little while since I've seen you. Yeah, there was more. I, I can't believe I forgot oh my about gosh. this one. <laughs> Just how... Uh, just to give everyone a picture of how normal it is to find like dead things lying all over the place um my my dog killed a bird there you go he's got evil he's got a body count now (laughs) did it he did ripping Um, bits of it off though we had to like just pick it up i'm stalling what did you find (laughs) well i was driving around and i found a uh, a carcass which uh, I thought at first was a very large kangaroo and then I realized it was way too big to be a kangaroo because it would have had to have been a cow sized kangaroo so I did a u-turn in the car came back and had a look at it and it was a headless deer <laughs> somebody had shot and cut their head off a deer <laughs> it'll go with your, your your fox stole in the trophy room yeah. so and that wasn't me <laughs> Someone, Someone chopped the head off Someone and didn't, has a very, it didn't take very the meat. large pair of antlers on the wall. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, yes, but they just left the carcass behind. So, uh, yeah, lots of decapitations happening. It's, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm in the middle of the red terror of the zoo. Um, I yeah. saw, I just, did, I don't remember where I saw it and would not be able to find it. People, if you can find this, there was a thread on some kind of like, group listers or something about this woman whose dogs got their way inside an elk carcass, I think, and gnawed little portholes out out that they could look in. She couldn't get the dogs out of the carcass because it was big enough for them just sitting there eating. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know which was her narrative of it was pretty wild, right? It's like she had this little... They'd gnaw holes through it so they could look out and I guess stick their noses through (laughs) How do I get them out? <laughs> Nature is horrifying. Oh <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. It does make you wonder where we fit in to all yes. of this. The murderousness yes. of nature. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's talk yeah. about men and women first, though. So you, mm. the, the, you're, so okay. you're. <laughs> <laughs> Your rooster meditation led to yes. some, some, some. I think quite profound reflections on the need for the need for <laughs> roosters to defend their hens, and the, and that you found Elvis and and there were two roosters, right? And that that they they ch- clearly tried yes. to chase chase the fox away and gotten ropes beard themselves. Yeah. So valiant yeah. valiant yes. nobility of of your <laughs> during the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> the first estate fought valiantly was it the second estate um the look those roosters they were champions so we had two of them one was elvis presley he was a loud boy that everyone could hear when we were streaming uh the other one was his little friends uh who actually had way more uh, way more time with the girls than elvis presley elvis was too <laughs> too busy guarding everyone to worry about romance but this is, this um, is typical of of human communities too sometimes right it, 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 <laughs> the parallels are very very strange <laughs> king like arthur first... and lancelot right now <clears throat> yes exactly <laughs> so um yeah my arthur and lancelot they both died but they but they died protecting the girls so uh basically i found their bodies uh one of them the speckled one was right next to uh bandit the pirate hen and Elvis Presley had done a runner right right to the back. Mm. Uh, uh, so obviously he'd been trying to chase whatever was getting the other girls because we could see a long line of feathers. That he was <laughs> wow. to, to where he was going. So he, he put up a he put up quite a fight which is wonderful so in my grief I started to rant about every <laughs> the dynamics of the the flock um, without roosters in it because um, it seemed to me that that was uh, essentially what everyone in the post Boomer West has grown up in uh, hen houses with no roosters. And so um, I wanted to celebrate 
the bravery <laughs> of Elvis Presley, um, but also reflect on all of the hen hate that uh, we're seeing in response to the the breakdown of uh, of, of all of like a, a normal social structure that uh, we should be enjoying. Um, because it's it's interesting when you're finding uh, when you're finding yourself taking care of female animals, you start to mm. understand a little bit more about why uh, they behave the way they behave and um, <clears throat> what removing a, a masculine protection from female animals does to them, uh, how it changes the dynamics. And then I was thinking, well, how is this going to change the dynamics of the human uh, the human world as well? Which made me realize that hating on the hens uh, in in a scenario where uh, the foxes have essentially taken over the hen houses uh, seems uh, counterintuitive. Yeah, we had we had a, a meme show up in our in our chat. Ooh, I, I put the I've, I've I've blown the joke. There we go. There's the one without your your annotation. <laughs> so so we have we have Barbie and Ken. You guys, we're never going to get away from Barbie and Ken. You realize this is now the Barbie and Ken commentary stream. No. Um, so Barbie is saying, I take care of myself. I pay my own bills. I have my own car and have my own job. I'm a strong, independent Barbie. And Ken says to her, no, Barbie, you're an adult. That's what adults do. You're not special. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that triggered me too. Yeah, so you added some commentary on it, which I, 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 I Ken is an arse. <laughs> <laughs> my closed captions kills closed captions <laughs> would you like to unpack this a bit for us <laughs> okay <laughs> in reflecting on the ass. presence of roosters in the in, among the hens and we should bring in mel gibson at some point because you know we can we can oh, most definitely yeah, yeah most definitely um well i'll respond to that meme because it was just uh it was hen hatred right so uh the I, f I find it really strange um the contrast of people who are angry at the liberated women you know uh hens who are pseudo roosters or that have had to grow up in an environment with no roosters around them um that they're now being mocked for having to declare that they're capable of doing things yeah. right and then I was looking at that meme and thinking how stupid it was really, because what it's done is it's, it's set up to mock women for wanting to be celebrated for, you know, basic, basic life functioning, <laughs> but it's the person doing the mocking, which changes the, um, changes the, the frame of that entire thing because it's Barbie's boyfriend. It's the man, it's the man who's supposedly in love with Barbie, who's mocking her right. for, trying to uh do all the things which if you read the list <laughs> are essentially things that you should be doing for her so I, her I was bills, thinking about this getting buying her paying cars her bills. to having the job mm -hmm. so she can have eggs yeah yeah so she can sit on her yeah. eggs and raise her little yeah. chicks um and then i was thinking about this like uh the mockery of women and what that really is because of course my rooster elvis presley he didn't mock his hens right. they were doing all of their little things and constantly uh challenging the pecking order and, and and doing all sorts of things uh he wasn't concerned with what they were doing he had one job and that was to protect that flock right. um the so the <laughs> i'm not very smooth on this uh, um the, well, what what we're trying to, I mean, what we're practicing tonight is helping people flip these pictures, which is like, we started, okay. we started with the picture that got shared. I can't remember whether it was my chat or yours, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Sometimes our chat, our chats are mirroring each other, right? <laughs> Although you will, you all, well, will appreciate Fencing Barrett Prayers Dragon Common Chat is different from the diner. You get different sandwiches in the diner. Than you get in DCR, so just you know, yeah, be in both, yeah. right? Because they're they're not identical, although they're 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 <laughs> shared they're shared <laughs> conversations. Um, but that the, you know, whoever shared this the first time was like, oh look, you know, let's mock women because it it you know we're allowed to mock women in 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 to professors chat or in the diner because 
we know that the women in these chats, you know, want men to be taken care of the, the, these things, you know, right? And so mock away, mm -hmm. right? And and I think you did, you yes. surprised whoever posted it um, when you said, no, Ken, in this context of the story, is the one that is, in fact, should be mocked. Because if mm -hmm. you want, if, if he is actually taking on the role that he alleges that the men... I think this. Let me unpack all this for you. Your 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 rooster yes. distressed. I I I guess henless without a rooster. I have to be. I was I was very I was very triggered. Yeah, well, <laughs> but but the thing is the trig the tr the triggering matters because people are getting all triggered by all of these opposite world situations. And yes. we have three that we yes. wanted to talk through with everybody tonight. One is this: the men and the women. And we've been we we started. We figured we'd warm up with this one because if you're not used to this problem yet. We're never going to get you to the other two. <laughs> um, um, the, the, I alluded to the second one, which is you know the the theological theological debates that we're constantly ending up in with the the sort of mocking of, um, you know, you don't have scripture, you don't have this, you don't have that, and that this sort of weariness that we have, trust me, <laughs> of trying to to show you the the mirror version of things. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you guys got to stick around because we're going to do the big one. That book that just got, no, wait, no, there is a book and that everyone's talking about that we all should have been talking about for 20 years or more, um, where we are never able to show people in your and my chats how they, they are getting all of the narratives backwards. And and that's that's the the, the theme mm. of this this stream, which does have a theme, and I control these things because I can. I hope um, is the mirror mirror right? This this you start off with on yes. the fox's side if you could sing that song, <laughs> and then and and then realize <laughs> what the hen side looks like, and then the rooster and the hen, and then the the, the you know the Christian and the pagan, or the Christians and the Aryans, right? The Orthodox and the Aryans. And then we're going to do the big ones. So stick around, but we have to pace you through mm -hmm. this because everybody gets triggered by the mirror that they're not looking in correctly. So mm -hmm. I, maybe, maybe our theme is through glass darkly, but anyway. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. The, I um, do do this on uh, purpose, you know, however, yes, I yes. am, I am it's told sometimes that I'm a little hard to follow in the leaps that I make between themes, because to me, they're all connected. And what we found in both the sandwich diner and in Dragon Common Room is that sometimes people get lost in things that we think are perfectly plain. And so we figured we needed to give you, <laughs> give you a bit of lesson in the method of talking like kilts and, 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 and Doc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <In> footnote. <laughs> not headless not let not the headless chickens <laughs> that we sometimes sound to, we have uh, heads sound like we are and our and we want roosters mm -hmm. defending we those do. heads from foxes mm -hmm. but, yes, but apparently yes. you guys all want to be foxes or something we're not sure well mm. so this is the this is the conversation right now the debate on the behavior of the hens. Hens, in my uh, in my experience, are very very predictable. They are essentially going to do what hens do. Before we had the roosters, uh, they they establish their pecking order, and then they have the dominant hen, and everyone sort of making do with what they can, uh, you know, what they can get a, get. A, get along doing so you actually you had the hens inter before you got the roosters yeah we've had we've had hens before we got the roosters so you know what that you know what they, so, the, the girls behave like in the absence of roosters mm -hmm. so the, this this book yes. i i did not do my homework tonight because i was making a syllabus on how to read the gospels we'll tell you about that later um one of the books that I loved growing up was about hens. It was called Flossie and Bossy. And in light of this, I'm going to have to go back and reread that book. But one of the things was, is, you know, the hens on their own. Carry on. A little interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Not as affectionate as you would expect them to be, considering their little hens. They're supposed um, to be all mothering, like a mother hen takes her chicks under her wings, and they're supposed to be, you know, they're, the model of feminine, you know, <clears throat> compassion. They're vicious. They're vicious. Little, they pet little each dinosaurs. Other. <laughs> they, hit, 
Yes, they are. They're little little dinosaurs pecking each other, fighting over who gets to have what little bit of seed that's dropped on the ground, getting annoyed when the other one steps on their feet and blah, 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 all of these kinds of things. So and this is the way they behave. Let's be similar. clear. This is the way they behave with no rooster around. Yeah. That they, yeah. they cannot yeah. manage their own this social behavior, their own social interactions. They just get, they hint, they they're, peck each other. They're constantly trying to upend the social interactions because they're not satisfied that there's the established order. Uh, you know, you think you, you think you know who fits where and then all of a sudden something changes and they're fighting. Again. And there's blood and feathers <laughs> all over the yard. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't get that bad. It just gets very, uh, very pecky. And uh, so we no got the blood and feathers. In, I'm, and I'm disappointed. I mean, that, that sounds like no, all daytime no television, carnage. right? It's like rea <laughs> <laughs> reality TV the with the women of, fighting. Come on. Days of our clocks. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, that's um, good. <laughs> so, <laughs> it should be the next book. Um, so Actually, we've got uh, after all of the, this. We are deep, guys, we're deep in the middle of writing Act 2 of, of Drake Alchemicus, but no, there's going to be a rooster ballad. There has to be. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, almost definitely. definitely. Um, so we got the roosters and suddenly the, the girls are not fighting as much, if at all. Uh, it's interesting. The boys wait for the girls to eat. It's ladies first with the roosters and the hens. So they stand there and they watch them eat for a couple of seconds to, to make sure that everything's okay. And then they uh, they join them. And then they all got very cuddly after a while, uh, sort of behaving uh, more and more like pets than uh, little egg factories. So everybody was much calmer. <laughs> and... Uh, they would roam further and, mm. uh, you know, they were kind of bolder because they had someone watching out for them. So when the meme was posted, this is all swimming in the back of my mind because uh, what has happened is people are arguing, everyone's arguing over the, the post-feminism female behaviour. What's happening with all of these women? Why are, why are women behaving that way that they're behaving? And it seemed to me a very simple case of not actually looking at the conditions that the women have been raised in. Well, there's so this, you're judging there's this the massive lie that we have been fed my entire lifetime about feminism and sisterhood and, 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 oh, and yeah. the constant claim that, you know, if there were only women in charge, there would be no wars. Um <laughs> 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 Elizabeth the first oh, really? pirate queen <laughs> right you know so no I mean it's and it's historically provable that that's not the case but it it persists as this mm -hmm. fantasy that oh yes women if there were just women everybody would be getting along now not that every animal analogy works we we use the animals to no. study and and watch for patterns so that matters the hen the hens work the hens really work um, but, uh, they're very, very simple. They're, they're very, very simple in the way that they operate and the way that the behavior changes in the, in the presence of, uh, a rooster mm. guarding the flock. It's, it's, it's amazing. So someone who posted the meme of Ken mocking Barbie, I thought, and oh, this is interesting. What we have here is someone who's posting a kind of, um, like a sardonic mockery of a woman who's roosterless talking about things. Yeah. Talking about things that she has to do in the absence of somebody to be doing all of these things for her. And now if that was a woman, I would think, okay, that's to be expected. Why? Because hens like to peck each mm. other. But in this case, it was interesting because it was Ken mocking Barbie and Ken is apparently in love with Barbie, supposed to be in love with Barbie. And yet he's mocking her for having to describe all of the things that he's not doing. For <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, aha, ding, ding, this is the meme. And now I will flip it and I will show everybody how it looks. 
from the perspective of the Barbies who are talking about doing what they're doing and either not saying it plainly, not being very blunt, or that are being purposefully misunderstood by everybody who just uh, uh, has had enough of the, the feminism stuff mm -hmm. to even bother to understand them anymore. Which brought me to my kilts closed captions, Ken is an <laughs> ass. <laughs> um, because in this, which in this I looked moment, up to see whether or not it's like now we have this picture <clears throat> with your handwriting on it, whether that now now we're we're in in dangerous territory linguistically, whether that's rude or not. <laughs> oh, <laughs> apparently it's more rude in British than in, in American. So I don't know. Right. You're in Australia. Who knows? I I still got no. I got called out rude. one time when I was calling. You know, it's like we're watching Mr. Brand be de demonetized right now on on a platform we share mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, uh, that that's an interesting rooster. Uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 when when Milo got deplatformed, and I was mad at the the uh, supposed our side for for you know one, I didn't understand on the day that I wrote that how much well, whoever, which sides there were, right? But it's like, why were the conservatives allegedly ganging up on, you know, Milo as rooster <clears> to <throat> kick him out? And I, I said a, I said a word that now is, a, you know, it's like forever on my Wikipedia entry <laughs> because I was so angry. It's been cast in digital storm. Yeah. <laughs> was that the spineless mm -hmm. one? I to me spine I, I think spines and I think hedgehogs I don't you know it's like I, who knows why right but there you go spiny spiny <laughs> it meant it meant you know jellyfish level of courage we needed spine you know spines like your roosters mm. Mm. um defending well, defending you know the taking care of the women so the women could do women things and th there were some other things that you were saying that that yes. about okay you've actually lived in technically a patriarchal society how the mm -hmm. women behave in that context yeah. and how different it is from the context that most western women are used to oh it's very different it's very different so no so rooster what, the hens are after each other with rooster the hens with rooster the hens are after each other but in the <laughs> <laughs> okay we're always after each other maybe that's it we're always after each other, but uh, no. So I, I think this is why it's bothering me so much because I left, I like I, leaving the West and coming back in and then seeing all the arguments over feminism. It just looks so ridiculous to me because that it, it's such a simple solution that everyone seems to be missing. <laughs> so I'm looking at Ken mocking Barbie. I'm thinking, okay, you're mocking her for basically not boasting, but. Uh, telling everybody what she has to do in order to get along mm -hmm. and de and demeaning it by saying oh congratulations you're just doing what the rest of us are doing okay so what is it it's a highlighting of a uh, of equality right basically ken is saying oh big deal you're the same as the rest of us you're equal which is why it caught my attention because this is the thing if you agree with this meme you're agreeing with the equality. What bothered me most about this meme was that there was an admission of equality here that Ken was willing to mock her for maintaining instead of offering a solution to it. So uh, <clears throat> the, the patriarchal world, it functions differently. Um, women don't brag about doing normal things like paying the bills and having their own car and buying their own car in a patriarchal in a patriarchal society women brag about the things that their men are doing for them mm. that's their bragging rights my man it's my, my, my husband bought me this beautiful car and my husband bought me this and... car yeah well, it start it's it starts it starts with everybody uh father's uncle's Brothers right they're not actually just their husbands. husbands it's not just husbands yeah. uh which is why i think my um 
you know, my outlook on this, it's not just a nuclear family sort of situation because women are never going to just brag about their husbands. Women in a really truly patriarchal society are inside the structure of men who are taking care of them. So it's my it's my hen flock with multiple roosters around. Some are brothers, some are uncles, some right. are fathers and whatever. But the women are bragging about the men, what they're doing for them, what they're giving them. Uh, they're bragging about how they can get away with things, how they're spoiled by all of these different men, how they can be indulged by all of these different men. And then when they're actually married, they get to walk around and show off how well their husband is able to maintain the lifestyle that they've grown mm. up with or give them something better. So <laughs> this kind of attitude, this kind of uh, female uh, bragging, uh, in the West, it's mistaken for something which is not feminine it's mistaken for uh, a kind of predatory way of um valuing men because oh, what you're what you're like, all, what you're regularly saying in your channel is like you're i want you know give me money <laughs> <laughs> it's like take yeah, care yeah, of me. Yeah, it's just like and the, yeah. be the, no, be the Chanticleer, be, you know, be the rooster on the mound, looking out for everybody and and making sure that the foxes mm -hmm. don't come. Yeah, I just cut off all of the decoration around. It. <laughs> That's all I've done. <laughs> I just cut off. I just cut off all the decoration, all the flowery language, everything gone, money, right? <laughs> but it's not that. <laughs> But we, 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 in it's, our poetry, like, we've been thinking a lot about gentlemen prefer, prefer blondes and uh, Marilyn Monroe's role in that movie of wanting the diamonds. Yes. 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 And it's saying, you know, yes. she, yes, she wants, uh, I, I, I think the premise is she wants to be, you know, married and faithful to, to whoever it is that she, she marries, but she wants the money because she wants to be taken care of. Hmm. Yeah, of course. And the the um, horrible fiction of all of this is that the women, the women being taken care of, you know, if you're being paid by an employer, he's not going to love you. He's going to replace you if you don't do your work. Mm -hmm. Now, the, which mm. which then then leads us to a different kind of socialist problem. It's like Christianity is better than every every other system. But we'll get <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> there <you end. laughs> the, the compare well, the comparative marriage uh, customs we will have to hold on hold for another another stream at at this point. But but right mm -hmm. now I'm just thinking about how sort of mistaken people have become about where the the source of the problem comes from. It's like the the, the yes. patriarch patriarchy is described as the problem when in fact it's the solution to the women one being at you know at each other's throats over prestige and status and chicken feed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's mistaken as being abusive and dominating rather than caring and protective. Mm. Well, if you showed that Ken and Barbie meme to the people in the places where I was living, they would read it and immediately say, what is wrong with mm. Ken? The same way I did. What is wrong with him? Why is he letting her do all of this by herself? Right. That's the first thought is what's wrong with him? <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not, uh, oh, you know, uh, welcome to the rest of reality, you know, darling, you, you've bought your own car. Congratulations, yeah. sweetheart, yeah. you know, with this, this mocking tone. No, the first thought in the patriarchal society is what is wrong with you? Why are you not doing this for her? So when you're in that kind of environment, uh, and you're around women that have grown up there completely unexposed to Western uh, corrosion of their uh, feminine mm. instincts. There's a kind of way of, uh, of doing things, which means they can't conceptualize that they will be in a place where they will be by themselves unassisted by men. It just, it right. just, this idea is like trying to describe life on Mars to, to try and explain to women that have grown up in this environment, we have to do things ourselves. There is, There are moments here where you are on your own. 
that if your car breaks down, nobody will stop and help you. This is something that they cannot conceptualize. So when guys are posting these memes, I'm thinking, okay, obviously you're angry at Western women for for chasing the feminism, but the the mocking of women having to survive in a post-boomer environment is not going to solve this because I can see the difference between the two societies. So it's like looking at the past Mm. and then now for us because... I mean, once upon a time, my ancestors lived in the same culture. So well, the, uh, I my mother did, kid, right? I mean, it's not actually that long yeah. ago. I mean, it's, it's that I'm I'm I grew up, you know, I grew up enough in the South to, you know, th- th- one w- Southern women get very good at indicating to a man that they need, you know, please change that light bulb. My mom can get anybody. A man walks in her house, he's changing light bulbs. <laughs> in like three minutes <laughs> it's a, it's a skill right so no it's 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 in fact it's not that long yeah. ago that even women in the west understood how to um negotiate these these courtesies right it's like yeah mm-hmm. it's, imagine my car mm-hmm. breaks down i'm gonna like look for a man to help fix the car that's what they do right and they like being good at yeah. it so you know it's 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 a sort of this opposite world that that somehow we are now expect i don't know how you all younger women deal with it because <laughs> it doesn't even occur it oh, doesn't hell, even occur yeah. to me not to expect <clears throat> men to be able to help me like you're on a plane he, he, the guys are going to offer to take the bag down for you of course they are why wouldn't they it, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know how the foxes um, turned into the the heroes and everything when these got these great roosters yeah. around to help take your bag down. But frankly, hmm, <laughs> hmm. Yes, it's fascinating. <laughs> the, the the amount of propaganda that had to be uh, pushed out to get the the roosters out of the the flock is it. Uh, that'll take a while for us to break. Okay, down. so we need. We um, need. To, I think. I think we've established this as a problem, right? So we need. We need some. We need some medicine here, right? You ready? Yeah. Let's use. Okay, so. Yeah. So we need some medicine. Christ is the best medicine. But. <laughs> how are we going to help people see that? Do you see there? There is a similar problem in the arguments that we've been having about feminism with the arguments that we end up having about Christianity. Mm. Oh yeah, very similar. <laughs> Want to sketch them out for people who don't follow our 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 our, our um, um, Telegram conversation? That's <laughs> the ongoing that ongoing argument that I've been having. <laughs> um, Everybody, what you're seeing on screen is the most famous icon that we have of Christ. It's the oldest surviving one, I think, and from Mount Sinai. And it's it's very weird because mm. it seems to show him in in a very dynamic aspect. But we'll talk about that in a bit. Mm. Why is Christianity so hard to explain to people? I actually I'm serious about this, and we do we we want to sort of we're working on yeah, feminism, yeah. and I think we really need to this year do a lot of work on this unpacking why Christianity is so hard to explain because I I fear that it ends up as feminism does it ends up you know like taking the hen side or the rooster side when you're actually part of the same team or you know that mm. we end up we end up in these arguments regularly in the internet conversations about how you know well, you catholics which kilts isn't she's orthodox coptic therefore you know stop it there, there's a broader broader problem here than just protestant versus catholic stop get your heads out of the the west is the only conversation <laughs> um and 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 this this sort of nonsensical oh we can beat you Catholics if we point to the Pope and and claim that Peter wasn't Pope I don't know it's so dumb, and and I've spent you know a long time in my career obviously trying to figure out how to show people Christianity from the other side as it were it's like what would it look like if you could actually see this mystery as something that's a joy rather than Again, like mm-hmm. the patriarchy, I think, this sort of oppressive structure that you're yeah. desperately trying to escape. Well, if you escape it, guess what? You don't have anybody to protect you from the foxes. Mm. Yes. 
Well, that that was my point of calling Ken an ass. <laughs> because it, it was linked. Mm -hmm. uh, it was this... Um, it was this interesting way of describing a, 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 um, a, 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 der a derogatory kind of attitude. Whereas my point was that this, in our in our mm. faith, in, in, for 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 all of us, we've been given all of these prototypes for what is our ideal to become as men and women. And so I pointed out at the, uh, at the, at the Ken and Barbie point that we've got the, the Proverbs 31 that everybody always references, right. you know, oh, you want a virtuous woman, you know, a virtuous, a virtuous woman is hard to find her prices above rubies. And yet I'm looking at the list of the, <laughs> the qualifications for this pro Proverbs 31 woman. I'm thinking, hold on a second. Okay. Barbie, she's aiming for them mm. all. These are all ideals that are made for women. <laughs> are the men even meeting them? And then I thought this is a really, really interesting thing because not only is, is that woman far more uh, uh, I independent looking as an ideal prototype mm. than most people would be uh, um, expecting, most of the men that are hating on femi femi uh, feminists and liberated women now fail to even fit the, the, the prototype that's been given for a woman in the scriptures. So I was thinking about what it means when you've lost the prototype, when you've lost the, the field of reference for what actually uh, we are all basing our, um, our ideals on. And I think this is why we're having such a hard time describing Christianity mm. now, because it's like trying to describe the patriarchy in a world that it doesn't have this patriarchal culture where everything is like oxygen. It's just a given. I mean, like I'll, I'll, I'll go on a quick tangent to try and explain it to everybody, but it was so relaxing. Like I was very skinny. I was eating a lot of food because I was so relaxed. I just woke up and I assumed that I, wherever I would go, I would be getting help and someone would be telling me pretty much what to mm. do in terms of complicated, complicated problem solving. It was all outsourced to this large army of men that were all related to each other or um, were very closely linked through like family and, and, and uh, community bonds. And so no matter where I went, I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. Nobody bothered me because they all knew, you know, uh, the people that I was with and associated with. And so everybody just left me, you know, it was wonderful. I could go anywhere. I was completely safe because if something had happened. Actual privilege. Are they... Yeah, 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 it really was. It was, it, it was like the the kind of privilege that I think a lot of women are uh, <laughs> assuming certain people have. I had it. <laughs> um, was it because you were? And it, you're not white. No, it had nothing to do with my skin color. It, but the thing is, this this is actually exactly the meditation I was having when I wrote that three cheers for white men post, which is saying, do you realize what it means that you can walk around unmolested? It's all of the men mm. behaving well. Yes. 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 That's exactly what it and is. And I was saying white. I mean, uh, I was keep reflecting on that. I was saying white because I was saying, you know, the culture that we live in, because the, the big the mm. big joke was always like, we don't want to study any of that Western civilization anymore. It's all dead white European males and we can deal without them, right? It's it's our anti-rooster rooster screed. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, three cheers for roosters. Let's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. three cheers for the roosters <laughs> who defend you so that you can carry on pecking mm. and, you know, happily, you know, being hens. Well, I mean, people can, uh, I mean, people might be very surprised to know that there was some like very, very intense racism in that society. And it wasn't towards white people. Mm. It was towards other nations of like, people that would be lumped into the same category because they've got skin, similar skin tones. The thing is when you live in a world that isn't uh, ruined by uh, the post enlightenment uh, Darwinism race mm. categories where you lump everyone in together that has the same skin tone, you see the subtlety in cultural distinctions. And the men that I was with, they hated passionately. I won't mention which cultures, but uh, <laughs> there were quite a lot of them. Uh, 
based on the fact that they knew that they treated their women like crap. Interesting. Yes. And it was a point of pride for them to say that they treated their women well. And they really did. And were uh, they doing that because um, they had Western values? They're not Westerners. <laughs> so they, they, they simply, they prided themselves as men on taking good care of their women. And they disliked their local other opponents because they didn't. Yeah, yeah. And it had zero to do yeah. with equality or Western. Very interesting. No, they consider, I mean, this is like African racism, which is a, like a whole <laughs> rabbit warren, if you want to get into it. <laughs> but uh, again, it's not what Westerners think it is, where it's either like whites hate blacks and blacks hate whites and that's it. Like, I mean, African racism is like, uh, welcome to the jungle. We, we're, we're racist against everyone and everything, except for our like tiny tribe of 250 people. Right. Because well, it's actually, it's, like, it's tri fell, tribal solidarity. Yeah. yeah, it's tribal, sol yeah, it's tribal sol solidarity. So, um, no, the, the, the people that I lived with, uh, they considered uh, a lot of other, uh, a lot of other Africans uh, to be uncivilized barbarians because of the way that they treated their women, mm. uh, uncultured. Uh, interestingly, they had a very high regard for poetry. So that factors in again to the civilizing effect of language development and everything. But, We're going to um, get you all no, to learn to hate... scan. It's, it's, it's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> They hated a lot of Asian cultures for that reason. Because uh, because of the way Western... they treated their women? Yeah, because of the way they treated their women. Yeah. Um, Roosters are proud to have good hens. This is, this is yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they also despised a lot of European cultures because of the way they treated their women. Because in their <laughs> view, Europeans turned their women into whores. Right. So again, it's it's like when you've lived with people like that, you you kind of think about things differently and go um, go about your analysis of different cultural clashes a bit differently. So um, yeah, this this is kind of this is your headspace. You're thinking, okay, well, it it must be like they all look the same, so they think the same. It is not so, right. and it's the same with the religious problems. Like we're trying to explain Christianity to everybody, you and I, all the time, getting into these arguments with different kinds of Christians. <laughs> now, now we're into the Christianities, plural, isn't it? Yeah. Um, how are we? Uh, like, how do we explain to Christians in the West the way that the ancient church was thinking about our faith and everything? Mm. And it's basically me trying to explain African racism to Westerners that are worrying worrying about bull killings, but not really understanding how like right. everybody is racist. <laughs> it's just you 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 get uh, subsumed into a tribe. Or a nation and you're with them but it's still like you know in group out group that's the way it works it's not a skin color thing it's a cultural thing so with christianity we have this problem of trying to explain to different christians why we're doing things the way we're doing uh, doing them mm. why why we have our particular traditions the way that we're practicing them and also why we consider their christianity to be lacking to put it politely which is the 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 uncomfortable thing to to introduce, especially when people are not willing to step on the other side of that mm. mirror and look at it from the other side. People can't flip the meme. It's very very hard for them to flip the meme. We we all get stuck into a particular viewpoint. We get stuck there, uh, and then. Yeah, it's very hard to push people and to get them to flip it. So, so the meme, the meme that the the Barbies are trapped in is the is the individual, right? like the the, the mm -hmm. primacy of the individual, yes. and I'm going to be the adulting, right? It's like you're just doing that thing that all of yes. it, all of us atomized individuals, which you know the 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 um. It's 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 the thing about no sex, right? The 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 the, the homogenization of men and women into just mm. individuals, yes. which is what what mm. Ken in that meme is mocking Barbie for. Um, so there's mm. that, but then there's there's 
the next stage, which is the, the Christianity stage of the homogenization of religion into, you know, you do your thing, they do their thing, the, the sort of, the reality of the truth is meaningless because it's, and, and I, this, this is one of the things that I, I find most frustrating about the way people tend to behave as Christianity on online is, oh, we'll, we'll just be Christians over here, right? We'll, we'll separate ourselves out and just be Christians over here, mm -hmm. or we'll have our tribe that, so that it turns into this, I mean, equality of custom and they, they're like all atomized individual um, apparent truths something like that i'm aiming i'm trying to aim at chesterton here <laughs> it's like there there's, uh, there's yes, a, yes. because we're, we're saying there is a right thing for the men to be doing for the women and to be taking care of them right and there is a right understanding yes. of god's relationship with us that christianity we believe because it's true has with us and that mm -hmm. you know christ as our rooster is going to be taking care of us and that's that right and there isn't any like other choice of truth which is the mm -hmm. very frustrating thing that I find in talking with even, well, not even Christians, because they're usually trying to battle that out over which of us has the most pure version of everything. Um, but that we aren't typically terrifically good at, in fact, explaining why Christ, which is mm. what really matters. <laughs> yes. I'm gathering my thoughts. <laughs> well, so I have an example, right? So here we have in the in the in the Sinai icon, it's it's famously says it's like he's got two different sides, right? There's the human side and the divine side, or it's like he he seems like is it just badly painted that one of his eyes is different? Well, here's the mirror version, which as you can see, no, they're actually very different. The two halves of mm. the of mm. the icon and saying he is God and man. Now one of the, mm. the, the, our example version of this problem for tonight, one of the things that has typically tended to happen in the online world that we are trying to talk into, talk all these truths into, is I, I think it's similar to the men and the women. It's saying, um, you know, there's no essential difference between Barbie and Ken because humans are humans and sexes are irrelevant and you choose your gender and, and, and such like that. There's a similar kind of homogenizing of jesus into mm -hmm. um well he's he's basically a guy right and how dumb you are if you think he's he's god so one right and then and then the other being oh well the church is just you know an imperial institution that was imposed on everybody and uh Therefore, the church, the, yeah, the, the church as an institution is either simply imposed or the entire theology is all a lie because it's all an imperial construction. I think I, I get lost in these these um, homogenizations. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's an imperial construction. That's just what um, borrowed all of its uh uh, borrowed all of its main uh, mythologies from the pagans and then slapped on a Christian veneer. Right. The, oh, yeah. Um... Yeah. Like that. And that um, the, the, the sort of more commonsensical version is even if Jesus was in any way special, he couldn't possibly, this is the Trinity problem. <laughs> he couldn't possibly be mm -hmm. divine, which is what this icon is trying to show that he's both, you know, incarnate and, 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 and divine. Uh, because mm. the empire just made that up to something. There, there's always there's always sort of like well, missing entailments to how all of this is supposed to play out. Yeah. Right? Like Barbie's supposed to take care of herself, and that means being an adult. Well, Ken's an ass. Um, yeah. Christ couldn't have possibly been uh, the God Man because we all know these things are construct constructs of power i I'm, I'm trying to characterize this accurately <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm thinking about it uh yeah because that's the uh is it is it's constructive power accusation mm -hmm. because this is how it's been positioned uh or it's been proposed uh as a counter proposed to us that basically uh trying to find a kind of orthodox dogma in the church means that we've essentially said 
you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and kicked out all of these competing interpretations of the scriptures. And then that's, uh, that's then transformed into an accusation that we're, uh, we're in, uh, behaving like an imperial power and getting rid of all the dissenting uh, ideas and interpretations of, of the Bible. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it would seem like that, again, if you were looking at the church as a power structure that's there in if you think of the church as a power structure that's identical to an empire, sure, that makes perfect sense. Um, just like Ken mocking Barbie for adulting makes mm. perfect sense when you think, why is she bragging for paying for her bills and uh, buying herself a car? Like, it's uh, normal. Everyone does that, right? If you flip the meme and you see, okay, well, hold on a second. Ken should be paying for all of this. Ken should be doing what he's not doing. You flip the meme and look at the church in a different way. You think, okay, it's not an imperial structure. What is the church? The church is a hen house. <laughs> I'm, 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 okay. I'm Christ as rooster. I'm gonna, we're gonna go there. Yeah, mm. it's like, well, unfortunately, mm. Jesus described himself in, at one point as saying, like, Mother Hen, I'd like to gather you under my wings. So mm. we're conf we're confused. Anyway. Well, he knew how cute they Aww. were when they when they've got the little babies. They're very beautiful. I saw a video. I have a video on my um, channel right now of a hen caring for some kittens. <laughs> they yeah. they can keep a lot under their 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 bosoms. They can. They're remarkably expandable. You, know, you think, you think oh, no, it'd be like three, four max under there, and all of a sudden they get up. Whoa, you've got nine oh babies gosh. under you. What are you doing? Um. <laughs> the elastic chickens. So if you see the church in an imperial perspective, it makes sense. Okay, what you're doing is you're an imposing dogma because you're imposing an imperial um, uh, mythology on everybody to accrue power. Right. But then if you if you just take the moment to flip the meme and you, you read it on the other side, you'll look at the church and what is it? Well, the church grew inside imperial power mm. in opposition to it from the beginning, uh, not to conquer and replace it, but it was in opposition to the claim that the emperors of these empires were gods. This is like Christ saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. You know, the Caesars in Rome had basically declared themselves gods on earth. I mean, that was the, that was the proposition in Egypt for a long time, wasn't it? It was Pharaoh is God right. on earth. So the emperors of these empires that look very um, prestigious to us. Apparently now, men think the about the Roman about... Empire all the time. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Apparently. And then someone posted a meme this morning. It was great. The goths are coming. The, the, the goths are coming. So there's a big horde of goth girls running <laughs> and smashing against the legionnaires. <laughs> um, so... You know that that was the that was the declaration in the page, pagan world. It was the the emperor's god. Tyranny, to, totalitarianism. Of course, you've got your cults and on all of these other uh, religious practices and things that are going on. But uh, effectively, what it is is that you're subject to the imper uh, the imperium. You're subject to the imperial power, which declares its own dogma, which is power. power. Yeah. <laughs> It declares its own dogma that it, it has the right to define reality. Um, and Christ enters into that, and then the Christian church is, uh, the, the Christian church emerges in defiance of that claim by saying there is a higher authority than even the the um, the Imperium uh, of Rome, which is God above these empires. And you know that was the that was the Israelite perspective. That's what made Israel so mm. odd, uh, imperfect as we were. We were supposed to be carrying this uh, truth that uh, above the heathen gods there was the real one, true God. So, if you come into the church, then of course the church is still making the same claim. The only difference is they say we've met him face to face in the flesh scandalous <laughs> i think i think and, we need to get a lot better at explaining this because we and, as christians are being accused of doing some pretty horrible things oh yeah 
which things now <laughs> oh yeah which things now and so we we sort of yeah. i talked to my alt history lecture about the or conversation with hans about the spanish inquisition but i i think there's some others that mm -hmm. are said to be the fault of of christians mm -hmm. and that without christianity would never have happened and therefore we need to make sure and apologize endlessly for those horrible things that happen because of christians uh-huh well i think i think we need um, to get a little more clarity on this imperial argument right and um yeah the the one the what okay well, so but I, I, i've got some help here right it's got the same picture on the okay <laughs> um amazing <sighs> How the, our so our our prim our premise and and sort of play play tonight in the sense of thing that we're working on is how do we practice seeing when we need to turn the flip these narratives or see the way in which we've been mm -hmm. caught in one narrative and we're actually in a different one and of course G K Chest G K Chesterton is magnificent at this in um, helping you see the paradoxes that Christianity resolves. I mean, it's like you, you you think paradoxically about the incarnation and it's God man, and that seems impossible. But if you can see it from within the the reason, the, the sort of rational expl you know point of all of it, it, it makes perfect sense, right? You can't think that you can't think of it in any other way, and that that is, I mean, Chesterton of apparently Tolkien read a lot of Chesterton, so that makes sense that I like him. I like Tolkien and I like Chesterton, these sorts of senses of why have you gotten the argument exactly backwards mm. is the the real thing that we need to be wrestling with and thinking about. And of course, from Chesterton's perspective, for example, in his Father Brown character, the detective, Catholics are actually really good at this because we are actually trained in reason above all, right? It's like the the, the incarnation is rational and makes you know makes perfect sense it's not a mystery that you just have to go oh that makes no sense and and let it boggle at you that father brown and mm -hmm. his detecting and his stories is able to solve things and able to cut through the the um like lies and mystifications that people have been telling themselves like i don't know women should have to you know do everything without a man um and that we need practice at this kind of of flip yeah mm -hmm. So the the one I yeah, the one do. I the one we I do. chose for us to practice on right now is when he's in Everlasting Man. We've got Everlasting Man, and he's talking through how we can see the truth of Christianity from the heretics. The the you know it's like he says the witness of the heretics, mm -hmm. and he's he's talking about how um, Chesterton flows right. It's hard to just leap in, but um, that yeah. that you know. When you see the when you see the opposition, it's often showing you the thing that is is clearer. So he's thinking about rationalizing, rationalizing explanations for the rise of Christianity. And here's the one that we've been playing with. Um, he says, okay, so take take another rationalistic explanation of the rise of Christendom. It is common enough to find another critic saying, Christianity did not really rise at all. That is, it did not merely rise from below. It was imposed from above. It is an example of the power of the executive, especially in despotic states. The empire was really an empire. That is, it was really ruled by the emperor. One of the emperors happened to become a Christian. He might just as well have become a Mithraist or a Jew or a fire worshiper. It was common in the decline of the empire for eminent and educated people to adopt these eccentric Eastern cults. But when he adopted it, it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And when it had become the official religion of the Roman Empire, it became as strong, as universal, and as invincible as the Roman Empire. It has only remained in the world at, as a relic of that empire, or as many put it, have put it, it is but the ghost of Caesar still hovering over Rome. So with that premise being is like the only reason we have Christianity at all because it was imperial power. And and therefore it, it reflects absolutely that tyrannical imposition. So all empires or, yeah. you know, are just like Christianity is just like all the other empires. Um, so he says, uh, end quote, this also is a very ordinary line taken in the criticism of, criticism of orthodoxy to say that it was only officialism that ever made it orthodoxy. And here again, we can call the on the heretics to refute it. 
um, I think this for our chicken, our chicken analogy is saying, you know, saying um, like the, the only reason women were it, it, it's, it's similar to things like the imperialist argument or the patriarchal argument. Women are only, you know, hurt because of patriarchy rather than patriarchy as being something that, mm -hmm. so you have to flip it and it's like, okay, but we can see, he says that in fact, um, we can call upon the heretics to refute this, this claim about orthodoxy. He says, <clears throat> the whole great history of the Arian heresy might have been invented to explode this idea. We meet a lot of Arians on the internet right now because they don't believe Jesus is God. <laughs> um, it is a very interesting history, often repeated in this connection. And the upshot of it is that insofar as there ever was a merely official religion, it actually died because it was merely an official religion. And what destroyed it was the real religion. Arius advanced a version of Christianity, which moved more or less vaguely in the direction of what we should call Unitarianism. Though it was not the same, for it gave to Christ a curious intermediary position between the divine and human. The point is that it seemed to many more reasonable and less fanatical. To, to many more reasonable and less fanatical. And among these were many of the educated in a class in a sort of reaction against the first romance of conversion. Arians were sort of mm -hmm. moderates and a sort of modernists. And it was felt that after the first squabbles, this was the final form of rationalized religion into which civilization might well settle down. It was accepted by Diva Caesar himself and became the official orthodoxy. This is the hilarious truth, right? The emperors became Arian. Yes. So when you're yes. claiming yes. that orthodoxy is an imperial imposition, well, the, imp the imperial imposition was Arian, <laughs> right? Um, the generals and yes. military princes drawn from the new barbarian powers of the north, full of the future, supported it strongly. The Goths, right? <laughs> No, but the sequel is still more important. Exactly as a modern man might pass through Unitarianism to complete agnosticism, so the greatest of the Arian emperors ultimately shed the last and thinnest pretense of Christianity. He abandoned even Arius and returned to Apollo. So Julian the Apostate, right? Um, he was a Caesar of the Caesars, a soldier, a scholar, a man of large ambitions and ideals, another of the philosopher kings. It seemed to him as if at his signal the sun rose again. The oracles began to speak like birds beginning to sing at dawn. Ooh, they're roosters, right? <laughs> Paganism was itself mm -hmm. again. He, the gods returned. It seemed the end of that strange interlude of an alien superstition. And indeed, it was the end of it so far as there was a mere interlude of mere superstition. It was the end of it so far as it was the fad of an emperor or the fashion of a generation. If there really was something that began with Constantine, then it ended with Julian. Um, so uh, this, this kind of... We, seen the history backwards problem constantly which yes, is chesterton yes. is, is really good at and saying <laughs> if one of the things you say about christianity it was it survived only because it was imposed imperially the version that was in fact imposed imperially yes. is the one that collapsed yes <laughs> it was what we would refer to as a heretical christianity that was the imperially imposed version of the christian faith gothic christianity <laughs> And it was the African orthodoxy, which was in contest uh, with that imperial version. So uh, that, that's the, I mean, that's the irony of, uh, of this whole uh, discussion as well, that the, the, the church was working in this uh, very difficult atmosphere to determine the the real truth of the gospel when barbarian converts had essentially imposed their understanding of the scriptures on the on the the people that first received the faith mm. from the apostles themselves <laughs> and found it very difficult to leave that arian uh reading of 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 uh of everything they, they, they couldn't bring themselves to come into uh, the thinking of the of the Egyptians, the thinking of the African church uh, that was saying, no, this is this is an incorrect interpretation. We have to uh, we have to reject it because what you have done is reject the incarnation and this has a profound, uh, a, a profound 
effect on human destiny to to reject the incarnation of God in flesh. So and specifically, uh, he goes on here. It's like that the, the, you're saying African. It's Athanasius of Alexandria, right? Actually, yes, actually in Africa. Yes. Um, and that what is rejected in the Aryan, rational, moderate, imperial version of thing is the, 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 the truth of orthodoxy, which is that this is about love, right? So he says, if there is one question which the enlightened and liberal have the habit of deriding and holding up as a dreadful example of barren dogma and senseless sectarian strife, the, the, this debate between Athanasius and Arius, right? It is this Athanasian question of the co-eternity of the divine son which we've seen, right? It's like, it's, it's, it continues to this day that people can't get this, that when we say God is love, there's a point. Um, on the one hand, if mm -hmm. there is one thing that the same liberals always offer us as a piece of pure and simple Christianity, untroubled by doctrinal disputes, it's the single sentence, God is love. Yet the two statements are almost identical. At least one is very nearly nonsense without the other. The barren dogma is the only logical way of stating the beautiful sentiment. What people say is barren. He's talking paradoxically, right? For if there is a being without yeah. beginning existing before all things, was he loving when there was nothing to be loved? If through that unthinkable eternity he is lonely, what is the meaning of saying he is love? The only justification of such a mystery is the mystical conception that in his own nature there was something analogous to self-expression, something of what begets and beholds what it has begotten. Without some such idea, it is really illogical to complicate the ultimate essence of deity with an idea like love. So if you can't accept the Trinity, you don't believe in love, basically. Mm. If the moderns really want a simple religion of love, they must look for it in the Athanasian Creed, orthodoxy. Um, the truth is that the tr yeah. trumpet of true Christianity, the challenge of the charities and simplicities of Bethlehem or Christmas Day, never rang out more arrestingly and unmistakably than in the defiance of Athanasius to the cold compromise of the Arians. It was emphatically he who was really fighting for a god of love against a god of colorless and remote cosmic control, the god of the Stoics mm -hmm. and the Agnostics. It was emphatically he, Athanasius, who was fighting for the holy child against the gray deity of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was fighting for that very balance of beautiful interdependence and intimacy in the very trinity of the divine nature that draws our hearts to the trinity of the holy family. His dogma, if the phrase be not misunderstood, turns even God into a holy family. Yeah, it was the uh, it was the African Orthodox that were fighting the the imperial dogma yep. uh, for a very long time. Uh, you know, as Saint Maurice and the Theban Legion did in their in their martyrdom against uh, against Rome, against the imposition of Roman imperial thought. And the Roman imperial religion, where Caesar is, is God, uh, Africans have uh, have been the ones to establish their resistance to that imperialism. That the church grows uh, in in contest with the imposition of imperial claims over over the ultimate truth. So. Uh, it's beautiful, really. I mean, Athanasius, he says, you know, the 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 love, the the divine love, God, uh, as love is impossible unless God, uh, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit uh, coexist eternally together uh, in in relationship. Uh, I mean, this is all silliness to an empire. Uh, what use does an empire have for love? Right. Empire doesn't need love. Empire just needs power. <laughs> it just needs to craft a mythology to allow the the imperial machinery mm. to run. But it's still concerned with love. So uh, it's it's something that you would miss if you're not uh, if you're if you're not looking if you're not willing to look at that uh, that early church in defiance uh, to these. Uh, to these things then you'll you'll miss it i mean uh, athanasius he was exiled like how many times i don't know several <laughs> it was sort of <laughs> one after another like he gets kicked out by everybody and sent all over the place because everyone's had enough of him <laughs> um he was not popular i mean this this is an orthodox uh position that was um communicated in multiple exiles, yeah. you know, uh, 
people well, who because are not it was happy actually with what easier. Was I mean, the Aryan position is this easier as cold and cosmic, yes. right? It makes sense. It reflects the structure of power, of, of you know, and yes. and the the. It's like when I remove love from from relationships and I just say money. Yeah, that's what they've done. They've they've cut out all of the the beauty of the gospel to reduce it to something mechanistic. Uh, sorry to cut you off, no, but good. I mean it, that that's what the that's what they've done. I mean it's a it's a kind of religion for the sake of uh, of running the machinery of mm. empire. Well, you don't need love. You just need obedience. You don't need to worry about the transcendentals because uh, we're people. We can't understand God. So let's just ignore all of that and then move forward with the rules and the rulemaking. I mean, that's the Gothic mentality. It's like a, um, we have no uh, need to be embarrassed and scandalized by something as horrifying as god himself becoming a human mm. i mean it's scandalizing uh, and it's 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 a very bold thing to say especially in that time because it's not a democratic environment we have a very strong at that time we had a very strong imperial environment where uh uh there was an enormous slave class mm. and people didn't ascend easily from that position so in that moment, it was even more powerful to say that the creator himself becomes um, a man born uh, born of a virgin in a manger. Mm. You know, it's, it's an incredibly scandalous thing to, to state. I mean, to say that the one who is more powerful than Caesar deigned to take on the flesh of uh, of of his own mm. creatures when caesar would never even pick up the cup that's been uh used by somebody that isn't uh, of his own class that's kind of my thinking because the egyptian system was so hierarchical mm -hmm. as well there was no vertical ascension in egypt you could go down you didn't go up um the 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 church flips everything from what people were expecting. The priesthood flips everything from what people were expecting. Yeah. Uh, the, that position wasn't open just to people that were raised, privileged, uh, highly educated uh, aristocrats. Uh, although many of the, the people that were in the early church were very educated and did come from, uh, from uh, privileged backgrounds, but this was not the... It, it was not the the ticket for them to get in and influence the religion. I mean, the the church it defied classes in a way that people in the ancient world were not accustomed to seeing. It so I'm just I, I I'm wondering why it, it it's like it would I think it was it was hard at the time. That's why they have the philosophical debates for centuries. For people to grasp this mystery, um, mm. and you know, it continues to be hard for people now. But it's it's this. I mean, I. Yeah. I mean, I it, I think it's just very terrifying because it's easier to serve. It's e easier. I have to frame. I have to phrase this sentence mm. properly. It's like the Ken meme. It's easier to just say that there is an equality than to state that there is a reality and there is an incorrect understanding of Christ. Mm. Like it's an uncomfortable thing to say, uh, we're we're not dealing with an equality of interpretation because everybody's used to equality. They're not used to patriarchy. So right. just like Ken is not used to patriarchy, he's mocking Barbie because she's trying to survive an equal world <laughs> instead of taking up his uh, responsibilities. Christians 
are used to this democratic environment where it's everyone can have their own interpretation and it's fine because they're not used to the patriarchy making decisions on the interpretation mm. based on all of these rigorous uh, uh, arguments that went on for decades. I mean, Athanasius was, Athanasius, he was, he was doing this for a very, very long time before people were, uh, f you know, starting to, um, work it out properly and then and once you once you have that you realize okay well if if not everybody can just make up their own interpretation and someone has a right interpretation has a wrong interpretation we're dealing with a problem because the the uh f i mean for them for the uh, with the arians it was basically saying one religiously you're wrong but two the machine of empire is now promoting a version of the faith which is a lie that's a i can use a, that as our segue now right? <laughs> okay yeah i was trying to get i was trying to get to the to, to our the to our, our third problem that we are can you say it's a mere so we've gotten to the empire and we've gotten to story and we've gotten to history and I, th these things fit together for me because we're in, a, you know, we're in crisis in civilization right now, and it's it's working at, you know, these these various levels. It's like men and women we can't seem to acknowledge that we need each other in the actual differentiations that the chickens mm -hmm. um, are demonstrating. We need to, and I, you know. I think it's fair to say you and I agree this absolutely, but explain it to other people. Everyone needs to be Christian, <laughs> but that that comes mm -hmm. out in these destructive ways that don't help. And then of course we end up in the, you know, currently collapsing empire of our culture mm -hmm. that we're, we're living in right now with methods of obliteration of both arguments and reputation that are just tragic and toxic. And of course mm -hmm. they're all swirling around right now, thanks to the efforts of one three letter agents, one three letter body. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you say certain things, okay. you will have your bank accounts canceled, your social media taken away, and your social reputation utterly destroyed because of another conversation that we're not properly having. That's why these all mm. fit together. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, mm -hmm. I need some more wine. <laughs> <laughs> I left my coffee. Oh, we did. Room. Yeah, well, yeah. You can't get up. You have to. You, you have to supply no, yourself on the no. on. I'm going on to have to get stream. through without my. It's like in a spaceship, right? You just just stay here for the I'm... rest of the the journey. <laughs> um, which of the narratives that we're living in right now is the hardest for people to see the mirror version of or the opposite or how do we even get caught up in it in the first place? Oh, which one should we guess? I have this book called The Holocaust in American Life. And I bet you all didn't think that was the one we were going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so mm -hmm. it's fascinating to me at these things that's like feminism. I've been, you know, boiling frog in water. We've been living that, with that one for a while. Um dealing with the, the sort of explanation of Christ and how hard it is for people to stop being relativist in their absoluteness. I mean, this is what's interesting about with sex roles, we're supposed to be absolutely convinced, absolute, right? Absolutely convinced that men and women are identical, which we're not. Um, with, with religion, we've been dealing with this uh, fantas fiction fantasy that Chesterton was also trying to deal with this. Oh, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. It's all just worship of something, right? Which of course ends mm. up, ends us up in the worship of idols in, you know, we got to do some more on AI. We did some of those in the winter, right? <laughs> but 
the idolatry yes. of yes. the present and modernity and things like that. But there is one narrative which we are told is absolutely unique, and to say it isn't unique is a crime, which rather makes it our religion. Hmm of the empire that we live in right now. Similarities are striking. And what I find interesting is I've had this book, The Holocaust in American Life, signed copy, hardcover, which means I probably bought it about at the time it was published. And I know the author because he, he was um, the first colleague that I met in my department, it, um, we were like, for the first year I was in, in the department, we shared a floor in the office and man, did he smoke a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Peter Novick, he also introduced me to the internet because he was uh, great uh, when he was, I thought, I think he was like the smartest person we've ever had in, in our history department, the University of Chicago, and we've had some pretty smart guys. Um, and he was already in 1994 when I started the university, um, interested in like browsing the web, right? I, we had email, but web browsing, right? He was using mosaic, which I thought was quite nice. It's like, we're on the mosaic arc. We're going to talk about Peter. Um, yeah. and he had spent 20, he'd done, th he did publish three books in his life. They're all magnificent. I haven't read the first one, but he got tenure on the basis of that one. It was about, um, the resistance, the French resistance. I need to read that one too. His second one he did on history and historiography and the way in which objectivity and historical narrative was, at the time he wrote it, considered impossible to achieve. He had this sort of, we were in the literary turn and it was all stories and narrative. And he said, nobody knew in 1989 when he published that noble dream, exactly what perspective we were meant to take so that we could see reality mm -hmm. because his example was in the American historical profession talking about the Civil War primarily. And he showed in that noble dream how the telling of what the Civil War meant and why it happened and what the sides were and the issues and such shifted from generation to generation because of, you know, the way we understand that his, historical narrative develops. Having achieved that, he then went on to spend the next 10 years researching the Holocaust and published this in 1999. And I think I think some of what I've been startled by most in the past several years in the way in which the Holocaust has become the kind of trigger that it has mm -hmm. for Americans is, as far as I was concerned, Peter showed us the problem already in 1999, a long time ago. Uh, he died in 2012, right? So, I mean, he was out, he, he lived for a good decade plus after the book came out and was able to go and give lectures. They're out there on the internets and such. And he pointed to the problems of the way in which the Holocaust was developing as a particular kind of touchstone in American culture mm -hmm. decades ago. And here we, and as we, and they mm -hmm. say, and yet here we are. So that simply mm -hmm. saying something like, the Holocaust, as for example, our previous conversation, you know, Kanye West said last year when he was talking to Lex Friedman that, well, you know, there's a Holocaust for black Americans in abortion. And this was considered horrific and, and um, anti-Semitic to say that there was anything comparable to the Holocaust. As Lex tell tells him, it's like, you can't say that the Holocaust is unique. Hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry, my brain's going. Well, to, I, so uh, I know you. You. You have directly. your copy is on the way of this, so you haven't. You. I'll. 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 Cut, I'll. I'll do a little introduction. Um. Peter wrote this in 1999 or thereabouts, right? He published it in 1999. Um, and there's there's two two major themes that he 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 wants. One, this is the Holocaust in American life, so it's the degree to which the Holocaust became a narrative in America, 
um, why it has mm. the prominent, why it had a prominence in 1999 that it did for Americans when, of course, the United States was allegedly the ones who like prevented it from happening or you know helped stop it because the United States of the Allies were the liberators of Europe and that the the Jews mm. who were affected by the Holocaust were not Americans they were in Europe um, and so he he sets that up as saying it it sort of makes it, it, it doesn't really make sense to have it as an issue of American identity, although by the time he wrote it, it had become an issue of American identity, which mm -hmm. was curious. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, uh, so he's talking about group identity, but he's, he's saying that the grounding of group identity and claims to group recognition and victimhood has produced not just a game of show and tell with members of the class waving their arms to be called on to recount their story. In Jewish discourse on the Holocaust, we have not just a competition for recognition, but a competition for primacy. This takes many forms. Among the most widespread and pervasive is an angry insistence on the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Insistence on its uniqueness or denial of its uniqueness is an intellectually empty enterprise for reasons having nothing to do with the Holocaust itself and everything to do with uniqueness. <laughs> I mean, this is devastating as far as it's like at the beginning of the book and he's set, setting it up and he's going to talk about it mm -hmm. some more saying simply saying something unique is intellectually a collapse. A moment's reflection makes makes clear mm -hmm. that the notion of uniqueness is quite vacuous. Every historical event, including the Holocaust, is in, in some way resembles events to which it might be compared and differs from them in some ways. These resemblances and differences are a perfectly proper subject for discussion. It's like what we do as historians. Mm. How is it like? How is it unlike? Right. But to single out those aspects of the Holocaust that were distinctive, there certainly were such, and to ignore those aspects that it shares with other atrocities, and on the basis of this gerrymandering to declare the Holocaust unique is intellectual sleight of hand. The assertion that the Holocaust is unique, like the claim that it is singularly incomprehensible or unrepresentable, is in practice deeply offensive. What else can all of this possibly mean except your catastrophe, unlike ours, is ordinary, unlike ours is comprehensible, unlike ours is representable? You know, I really wish some people would read a 20-year-old mm. book before telling us that we're being hateful to, to say that there are comparable atrocities even, right? Or that, I mean, and he goes on, he, po he, po he points out quite properly then you like it, it it has become so much so that to say to to deny the uniqueness is deny the event if happened because you've gotten sort of yourself tangled up in this this essentializing of well what right and then that is in fact what the point of his book is mm. to figure out why had it become why it had gotten to this point where even to suggest and i, I let me make another point here um oh yeah that um even to suggest, suggest by the point that he's writing that uh, the comparison with black culture was a problem, right? Um, For example, there was a federally funded museum memorializing their victimhood. There's no, there wasn't in 1999 um, a, a museum of the black experience. Blacks were well aware of the irony, which some Jewish commentators have also noted. It was American Jews' wealth and political influence that made it possible for them to bring to the mall in Washington a monument to their weakness and vulnerability. The, whole, the Holocaust Museum in D.C., right? Oh, yes. Those who remained weak and vulnerable, who were oppressed here rather than there, lacked the wherewithal to carry off such a venture. To remind you, Peter was writing in my neighborhood. You know, we're on the south side of Chicago, right? Yes, The yes. most common Jewish response to the charge that Jews were intent on permanent possession of the gold medal in the victimization Olympics had has been to protest that it was others, not they, who were engaged in competition. Because... <laughs> Talk about the mirror world, right? It's like they're gymnasts. They're uh, yeah. Jews were the <laughs> aggrieved gymnastics. party. Quote, they are stealing the Holocaust from us, said Eli Wiesel. <laughs> Others were illegitimately appropriating language and imagery to which they were not entitled. As we saw in the previous chapter, this was often described as the theft <clears throat> of Jewish moral capital. 
The use of the word ghetto for black slums was frequently cited as an example of stealing the Holocaust. Quote, there is no barbed wire across 125th Street and there are no guard towers. I mean, that, that re- I was a graduate student at Columbia, yeah. so I, I've lived in these neighborhoods. Like Columbia is right up against Harlem, right, which is at 125th Street. Mm-hmm. Um, quote, no place in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago was even remotely like Buchenwald in 1938 or Warsaw in 1942 or Auschwitz in 1944, end quote. He's quoting examples of how it was considered inappropriate to use the word ghetto. Um, The most commonly expressed Jewish grievance was the use of the words Holocaust and genocide to describe other catastrophes. This sense of grievance was rooted in the conviction and axiomatic in at least official Jewish discourse that the Holocaust was unique. And I was remembering this when I heard Lex talking to Kanye last last year, insisting that it was unique. And I'm like, don't you get it? This collapses. It's... It's offensive on, 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 on its face. Um, since Jews recognized the Holocaust's uniqueness, that it was incomparable beyond any analogy, they had no occasion to compete with others. There could be no contest over the incontestable. It was only those who, out of ignorance or malice, denied the uniqueness of the Holocaust who could be so foolish as to engage in competition. In parentheses, some scholars, in fact, characterize denial of the Holocaust's uniqueness as a form of Holocaust denial, which is where Kanye got caught, right? It's like... How dare you make a comparison with all those, you know, aborted babies with our suffering? Yeah. That, that's a denial, right? And, and again, Peter was calling this out 20-some years ago. The word unique is often used loosely and casually as an attention-getting intensifier. Try our unique dishwashing liquid. I met this guy last night, and he's like, unique. Claims that one's own suffering is unique and communicable to others are also common. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. But in the case of the alleged uniqueness of the Holocaust, we're in the presence not of loose usage and the hyperbole, but of serious philosophical and historical arguments, indeed a substantive scholar literature, which aim at logical and empirical demonstration that the Holocaust is, unlike any other atrocity, a demonstration that will compel non-Jews to acknowledge this fact. Um... And, and so forth. So it's 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 it, mm. it collapses intellectually, and makes it impossible to talk about at the same time. Um, mm. and and of course we've we've seen this. Um, the talk of unique just coexists with others with overlaps with and is inextricably intertwined with repeated insistence that the Holocaust is the archetype and yardstick of evil evil. So it's, 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 it's unique, but the measure, this insistence comes from secularists like Raul Hilberg for whom the Holocaust is quote, the benchmark, the defining moment in the drama, of good and evil from rabbis like Michael, Michael Berenbaum for whom it is the paradigmatic manifestation of evil. The claim that the assertion of the Holocaust uniqueness is not a form of invidious comparison produces systematic double talk. A rabbi in an op-ed piece for the New York Times writes that, quote, it is degrading, even ghoulish, to seek to prove preeminence in suffering. But, he continues, quote, the Holocaust was unique. and proceeds to offer statistical demonstration. Does anyone, except just conceivably those making the argument, believe that the claim of uniqueness is anything other than a claim for preeminence? Preeminence. Holocaust envy contends with Holocaust possessiveness, claims by others that they have experienced genocide or Holocaust, claims that are indeed sometimes hyperbolic, are treated as felonious assault. At the same time, within the Jewish world, there have been many critics of the fetishism of the Holocaust uniqueness, some of them like Ismar Schorsch, the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary and a refugee from Nazi Germany, quite imminent. For Schorsch, the obsession with uniqueness is, quote, a distasteful secular version of chosenness, which introduces pointless enmity between Jews and other victims. You guys going to read this book now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many things <clears throat> came to mind as you were reading that. Um, I mean, for, so the, the the issue that he's Novik is making is that the the claim for for the Holocaust being unique itself prevents it from being the yardstick to measure evil that it proposes itself to be. 
Right, because it it could be it could be the standards, and it it has comparons. And if it's unique, it can't. I mean, this is, this is literally mm. what Kanye got in trouble for, saying that there was some other, you know, it's like there, there, that it exists in a, a a comprehensible, you know, world where you're trying to. Um. Well, well, it's interesting because what it's actually done is it's taken it out of human experience. Right. Well, and he goes on, he talks about it's become it's become sacred, because, right? Um, insistence yes. on the uniqueness yes. of the Holocaust more broadly, the centering of the Holocaust in Jewish consciousness proceeded apace with the Holocaust increasingly sacralization. Important religious symbols like mm. the covenant or the crucifixion are always regarded as unique to the extent that the Holocaust has become a central symbol, not just of Jewishness, but of Judaism. It too must be unique. So he, he, Peter go, goes on there. It's like, it's like, it's ah, unique yeah. to become sacred now there's another step that he's going to take you to to say, is this really what you want your identity to be? And of course, I well, thinking this, about his argument said something like this on my Twitter and was called names, um, saying how dare she? And I'm like, that was his question to his fellow uh, Jews. But yes. it's setting up first with the intellectual problem as he does with saying if it's unique. And he says it's Eli Wiesel who gives it that sort of mystical quality that it can't be it can't mm -hmm. be understood it can't be comprehended it can't be known and and then and yeah and therefore it's mythologized and sacralized. Okay, so so Novik is saying it's been mytholo Novik is saying it's been mythologized and sacralized, mm -hmm. and therefore because of that it cannot actually be invoked for people. To refer to in their own suffering so it's sort of become this hmm, um, uh, that that that's a very interesting uh, problem because how, how should I put this if it can't be invoked for comparison so that people can use it as a referent for their own experience without them being accused of denying that it happens, then essentially what it is is a kind of uh, uh, a mystery that is impossible to interpret. Mm -hmm to anybody that hasn't participated in it. So you can't be initiated into this mystery. You're either a participant in it or you're not. That's an interesting way of making distinctions between people because if Novik is saying that this is what has happened, He seems to be describing the usurpation of the Jewish religion with the Holocaust as the defining uh, sacred mythology of Jewish people. Yes, that's precisely what he says happened. So and this, and now, and this, this gets even more interesting. Why did it happen? Hmm. Because this is happening in America. Right. This is not happening in any this other place. This is happening in America. And he says, Because why my... does it happen? Why does it take the form that it did in America with all the museums and the untouched, you know, the un mm. the the incomparability? And this the, the the mystery here is, and this this is why the sort of that it is a it is a it is a story that's being told. It was not a story that was told until the seventies. And he has a, mm -hmm. a very interesting talks about the post-war years so with just one example here um, that pretty much nobody talked about it in the United States for, for until the seventies. And he says, he's saying mm -hmm. um, like um, even among pr 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 private discourse among Jews, says, um, contemporary observers who commented on the matter were struck by how little American Jews talked about, or so far as they could tell, thought about the Holocaust between the end of the war and the 1960s. 
In his 1957 American Judaism, the only scholarly survey of Jews in the 50s, Nathan Glazer observed that the Holocaust, quote, had remarkably slight effects on the inner life of American Jewry in, the, in 1957. Right, so it was not this dominating identity in 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 this mm. period. In the same year, Norman Poderot surveyed contemporary Jewish attitudes in the article "The Intellectual and Jewish Fate," a title that might seem to promise a discussion centering on the Holocaust. It was not even mentioned. There was one unpublished scholarly investigation of the post-war American Jewish response to the Holocaust. Leo Bogart, who went on to become a highly regarded analyst of public opinion was a graduate student in sociology at the University of Chicago in the late 1940s, he wrote a thesis on just this subject. Bogart began with the hypothesis that an event of this magnitude would manifest itself through changes in group behavior and belief, specifically, quote, that Jews in America would react with an increased sense of group identity and cohesion, and perhaps with some symptoms of psychic disorganization, end quote. One of his approaches to testing this hypothesis was hypothesis was soliciting lengthy written statements from a number of young Jews. He found that except for two individuals who were in the armed forces in Europe at the end of the war, it did not appear that, quote, the extermination of Europe's Jews had had any real emotional effect upon the writers of the statements or that it has influenced their basic outlook, end quote. At the center of the project was the administration of an open-ended questionnaire to 100 Chicago Jews of various backgrounds. The response of his Chicago sample led him to conclude, quote, the murder of Europe's Jews has not strongly affected the basic pattern of thought and feeling of Jews in the United States, end quote. Mm. I, this is, I think this, one of the things that Peter, of course, you know, got in controversial hot water because that seems to be what we at the University of Chicago <laughs> do for saying this. Like he's saying he's writing this in the 90s when it's like the, you know, the dominant mode of Jews in the United States for thinking about themselves. And he says until the 1960s, that wasn't the case. Not for American mm. Jews. It's very interesting. So, so, um, so, would you like to speculate on what he said drove the before and after? It's like, how do we end up now? With, it's like it's unique. You can't touch it. You can't talk about it. It's it's the sacred. Let us speculate. Why does it need to become, and this is, this was his prim, this was his, his concern. His concern was as, as he'll, we'll, we'll jump to the end, right? His concern was why let Hitler win this way? Um, mm. He said, because he's also very good on history and memory and thinking about how this became, I mean, wh whether it was remembered, whether the event was remembered and how it became the source of identity for the group. Um talking about mm. collective memories and grievances and, and such. Um, and how, you know, American Jewish leadership is trying to combat the new anti-Semitism and, you know, whether we want our identity to be this embattled identity, right? Certain member of that three letter body should pay attention. Um, He's quoting Leon Wieseltier discussing Black Americans' memory of oppression um, and talking about how the collective memory of this sort can leave you sort of stuck, right? And the memory of oppression, oppression outlives itself. This is Wieseltier. The scar does the work of the wound. Injustice remains the power, retains the power to distort long after it has ceased to be real. It is a posthumous victory for the oppressors when pain becomes a tradition, end quote. And Peter comments, whether the memory is of slavery, the Holocaust, or any of the other terrible events of human history whose scars do the work of the wound, the role of that memory in group consciousness has to be carefully considered. There is a sense in which Emil Fackenheim was right to say that for Jews to forget Hitler's victims would be to grant him a posthumous victory. But it would be an even greater posthumous victory for Hitler were we to tacitly endorse his definition of ourselves as despised pariahs by making the Holocaust the emblematic Jewish experience. That, that's what he was concerned about, seeing what have we done? We've made mm. this our identity? Yeah. So that even to, to, to and he, he gives, you know, other examples or things like, you know, just offhandedly says things like um, many of the things that have come out about um, the, the atrocities, the 
for example, the rendering of Jewish corpses into soap is a grisly symbol of Nazi atrocity now dismissed as without foundation by historians of the Holocaust. If you're not able to even consider the whether or not the tale or the, the, the numbers he mentions where the 11 million came from and it was made up by the, the 6 million and the 11 million or, you know, like if you can't ask questions about the historical event, you have created one, a sense of um, this uniqueness, but two, g given yourself this identity that it's based on being hated. Why would you want that? Mm. Why would you want that? Apparently, because it's apparently because Jews are intermarrying with non-Jews. <laughs> what I have described that to what I've up to now described as American Jewry's inward turn can also be called and is often called a shift in strategic priorities from integration to survival. Integration, winning acceptance on every level in every area of American society, could hardly any longer be a priority by the 70s or 80s, since it was an accomplished fact, but that acceptance came at a price. The survival to which Jewish leaders increasingly turned their attention did not mean the physical survival of Jews in a hostile environment. Rather, it was the absence of hostility to Jews that was threatening. Individually, American mm -hmm. Jews were prospering. Collectively, they were being killed with kindness. In the words of one Jewish leader, the melting pot has succeeded beyond our wildest fears. A decline in Jewish commitment and sense of Jewish identity, particularly among the young, dramatically reflected in soaring rates of intermarriage, threatened demographic catastrophe for American Jewry. The word used to describe the most ghastly consequence of murderous hostility towards Jews was also used to describe the pre predicted consequence of benevolence towards Jews. The threat of assimilation was frequently described as quiet, silent, bloodless, or a spiritual holocaust. Norman Lamb, president of modern Orthodox Yeshiva University, quote, um, with a diminishing birth rate and intermarriage rate exceeding 40%, Jewish illiteracy gaining ascendance daily, who says that the Holocaust is over? The monster has assumed a different and more benign form, but its evil goal remains unchanged, a Judenrein world. Interesting. Okay, so that happened to Australia. Like uh, that happened in Australia, that assimilation, because this place is uh, um, the Australian colonies were were founded with the the first fleet of convicts that were sent mm. down here. There were Jews on the first right. fleet, so we've always had uh, we've always had Jewish pre presence in Australia, and uh, we have been very well assimilated into Australian society, uh, into the Australian colonies. So this is interesting because they're describing this fear that there's too much intermarriage. I'm laughing. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say by the late 1960s, more than 40%, like, get me like to get around. 40 percent of young Jewish <laughs> men, but only a quarter as many young Jewish women were marrying Gentiles. Over the next decade, newly liberated mm. young Jewish women were becoming equal opportunity intermarriers. It's the Barbie and Ken problem. <laughs> and by the Barbie's off getting her own beach house. What's going on? <laughs> and by the time of the 1990 National Jewish Population you... Survey, an overall rate of intermarriage was above 50%, with only about a quarter of the children of these unions being even nominally Jewish. Even if the rate remained constant, and why shouldn't it continue to rise, the ranks of American Jews a few generations down the road would be drastically reduced. Small wonder that from the 1970s on, survival became the American Jewish watchword. Yeah, but survival of what? Now, here's the, this is the question, because it's a difficult question to yes. answer. Because it's survival of what? Peter is flat out, Peter is flat about... out blaming, blaming, describing. I mean, he's, he's worried because he's saying, we have defined ourselves as Jews by this pariah, unique event. Mm. But on the other hand, the, the problem was the loss of Jewish identity and th there being nothing else that bound them together. Mm. Um, from the beginning of the concern for survival in the late 60s and early 70s, it was suggested that non-involvement of the young in Jewish affairs, their thinning Jewish identity, was a consequence of their insufficient awareness of the Holocaust. Rabbi jo Joachim Prince told the Convic Convention of the American Jewish Congress that young Jews' unwillingness to consider, quote, Jewish identification and solidarity, their indifference in matters Jewish, was largely attributable to their ignorance of the European catastrophe. 
Unless something was done, quote, within one or two generations, the beautiful edifices which have been built in Jewish communities all over the land may be empty. Bertram Gold, head of the American Jewish Community Committee, likewise attributed young American Jews, quote, lack of a sense of being Jewish, end quote, to the fact that the Holocaust was, quote, not seared into the memory of a generation born after World War II. Mm. So they were westernized and assimilated into a non uh, a non practicing uh, ethnic environment. Yep. So then we have an interesting tension here because this is fascinating. Okay, there's so much going on here. So we've got the because Australian the, the, uh, Australian Jewry never had to endure any kind of persecution. Mm. There's been no zero ghettos here since the, the, the first fleet arrived. This place has been paradise. <laughs> uh, but what they're essentially freaking out about in America is retaining an identity even though what, what you want is to assimilate with your neighbours, right. right? You don't want to maintain a permanent uh, distinction if you're going to a country and to establish yourself in that country and to become a part of that country. So now we have a difficulty and tension that they're describing losing the youth to assimilation and intermarriage. And what that meant was that they were becoming Americans. Mm -hmm. And in order to prevent a total Americanization, they needed to have something that would maintain the the Jewish identity amongst all of these uh, people. Now, usually, that would be religion. Right. But our religion, he, he, he talked about how victimhood became the, the mode in this period. So it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting because he's, in fact, writing against all the, the um, gender victimization narratives as well mm -hmm. right um yeah that uh and and he talks about how american culture is featured on victimhood and so and it was against this background and this cultural climate that vic virtually celebrated victimhood it, sorry it was against this background and in this cultural climate that virtually celebrated victimhood that efforts to firm up faltering jewish identity were mounted it is not that Jewish leaders deliberately and opportunistically latched onto a fashionable victimhood as the basis for an identity that can mobilize Jews and ensure Jewish community. In any case, as I've said, there's no united Jewish leadership capable of making such choices. Rather, yes. the heightened yes. sense of the victim removed inhibitions that had in previous decades led them to shun that label. The quote, culture of victimization didn't cause Jews to embrace the victim identity based on the cost. It allowed this sort of identity to become dominant because it was, after all, Virtually the only one that could encompass those Jews who faltering Jewish identity produced so much anxiety about Jewish survival. It was very hard to find mm. any other basis on which to ground a distinctive identity shared by all Jews. Yeah. It couldn't be grounded yeah. in distinctive religious beliefs. This is Peter, not me, since most Jews didn't have much in the way of such beliefs. It couldn't mm. be grounded in distinctive cultural traits since most didn't have much of these either. Support of Israel exerted a certain centripetal force, but in recent years, questions having to do with Israel had divided more than they have united Jews. The only thing that mm. all American Jews shared was the knowledge that but for the immigration of nearer distant ancestors, they would have shared the fate of European Jewry. And Merrick Garland just mm. said that in a recent statement, saying, I have this identity because of my grandparents, right? Insofar as the Holocaust mm. became the defining Jewish experience, all Jews had their honorary survivorship in common. Insofar as it attained mythic status, expressing truths about an enduring Jewish condition, all were united in its essential victim identity. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's a total opposite of the Exodus. To the polar opposite of the Exodus. Because in the scriptures, Israel's taken out of slavery. There's a it's an anti victim. Israel is brought out of right. Egypt, out of the bondage of the house of Pharaoh, and brought through the desert, the wandering, and into Canaan land to conquer. 
that is the establishment of the Commonwealth of Israel. It's a conquest of the Holy Land, the conquest of the Promised Land, the land of milk and honey. So this narrative that they've established in America is the complete opposite of what we had. <laughs> but as Peter says, it's not based on a, a religious claim. It's 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 this no answer, no. It, are, it, if, it, but for the fact that my ancestors came to America, I would have died. I I would have never existed. It's it's a. And and so it's it's this collective memory, but of of a wounding. And he, I mean, I'm fascinated watching this twenty years later. How much all of the things he's describing here have played out. Hmm. Hmm. And his main question, I watched some. I watched one of his lectures to remind myself about this. Saying, it's saying to fellow Jews, do we want this as our identity? Is this actually what we want as our identity? Does not, does not, as he says at the end, does not that give Hitler the 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 ultimate victory of making us defined by the fact that people hate us? Why would you want that well, as your self- identity? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a it's a self stigmatization. Right. You're putting the mark on yourself as a. Uh, uh, as uh, Novik said, you know, this pariah, you're putting the mark on yourself as being someone who's uh, inherently unwanted uh, wherever you mm-hmm. go, because wherever you go... It's going to flare up. Uh, it it will yeah. flare up because you're there. Right. I mean, this is a, this is a kind of... <laughs> it's funny, I know people like this... <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it's like feminist way, looking for mm. men to hate. It, it, it's like they're expecting expecting to have you know patriarchy imposed on you at any second. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it, it's 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 feminism hating men because me, uh, women have a mark, mm-hmm. you know, the stigma of being a woman, and therefore you're you're oppressed for being a female. But if you give up um, that oppression for being female. I mean that that's unfortunately why the Barbie movie is feminist in the way that they play out. You know, it's so hard to be a woman because it's all these contradictions. I mean, they're, they they are still working within that. It's impossible to not be caught by the patriarchy. Oh yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But the problem is that they've defined themselves by that, rather than you know, with our rooster image of well, you're within a. I mean, it's it, so it's interesting for, you know, as Peter's pointing out for American Jews, that they were marrying into the population here and were becoming simply Americans. Well, I mean, intermarriage kind of disproves the pariah status. If people want to date you and marry you, they, <laughs> they well, I hope they don't hate you. <laughs> Maybe they hate you so much they want to marry you to make your life miserable. Well, okay, you know, <laughs> the layers here. No, but, you know, yeah, you know, I'm just being, I'm being cheeky. But, like, I mean, let's just say everyone's doing it for the right reasons or whatever. It's not just, uh, <laughs> uh, they're, they're in love. They're right. falling in, in love with Jews. Right. I mean, that's what a marriage is, really. It's a proof. They're falling in love with Jews. So this then becomes a problem because they're they're losing their identity in these new new relationships with the with the americans that are marrying them and then having having a crisis about self definition i mean this makes sense to me because it's uh you know you're suddenly immersed in uh equality world like what role are you playing mm. now because if you've come from a family where you where you're, you're supposed to be jews right so uh uh you're suddenly assimilated into a new environment. It's like being a feminist in the, in the sense of like, okay, uh, I, I live in equality world. Then suddenly you're like, oh, this, this thing called a patriarchal society. How does that mm-hmm. look? You know, so it's a kind of a similar thing. American Jews caught between two different, two different worlds. We've got the equality America where it doesn't matter. We're marrying into we're we're, we're marrying in and there's no distinction anymore versus the other one, which requires a distinction in order for there to be a Jewish identity in the first place. Because if there's no distinction, there's no difference between Jews and non-Jews. Right. To be a Jew means you're making a distinction. Right. Right. right? So 
it's an interesting pickle because it's like they've developed this identity category to replace religious conversion. Yes. Now that's very interesting. Because if they have done that... <laughs> it, it rather explains a lot of the, the, the tangles really? that our conversations are in culturally. It does. It, it does. Uh, and, and why race is, doing... race is constantly pressed as this thing that we can never overcome, which as Christians we don't accept. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, uh, I, I mean... In that sense, it has to, how, how can I word this? If you're trying to fight assimilation, then you have to make sure that race is something that you can't overcome. Right. Which is why everyone's in the arguments that they're caught in now about skin mm -hmm. color, because what they're really doing is they're saying there is no such thing as ethnogenesis. There's no such thing as assimilation. Right you will always and forever be stuck in the same categories that everybody was in two generations ago, three generations ago, four generations ago. So it's a static category that cannot be challenged. And that explains everything about Western behavior. It explains everything about Western behavior. Well, so, but I think, so, and again, the, the talks I've seen that Peter gave, um, the ones I've looked at, they, he was giving to talking to Jewish, Jewish um, centers or audiences, or uh, they're hosted by institutes for Jewish study and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's, it, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a challenging problem because they were, as he was saying in the book, they, they were so well assimilated that we could just vanish into the population and nobody would care. Hmm. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> the the emphasis on the sacral event, and you can say communities are defined by sacral events. That's how we exist, right? That's that's yeah. why, I mean, it would be very sad if January 6th became our new sacral event by way of like, you're defined by how you, you know, identify to that. That I've been, I've been sort of meditating on this as a, what is the United States going to find as its sacral event? because we're losing the power of the ones that we'd previously held on to. And mm. um, that the Holocaust became sacred in that sense. It is why when you say you deny it, you're denying my existence. There is a, a reality to that statement because mythologically you won't exist without that sense of framing next yes, story. Yes, yes. So, or, you know, when feminists saying, you know, you're denying my existence. Every time one of these these stories is challenged, it's not just memory and, and, you know, sort of collective identity. It's your sense of being in truth at all. Mm. Yes. Yes. Because if one goes and the other follows, yeah. because they've been so closely enmeshed together. Which, I mean, to say this, we you know, in, in our meditations here, we're constantly trying to figure out why are people so anxious around certain symbols, certain stories, um, and yes, we're finding common threads, but I'm not sure they, I, I mean, so we're tonight we're doing this as like sort of parallels and, 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 and comp, um, similar examples, but I'm not sure they're, they're they all have a mythology, right? And the, the animosity with which people argue about Christianity shows that it has a mythological character the animosity which people argue about feminism or the holocaust shows that they have a mythological character whether that gives mm. us a theory of myth yet i'm not sure i think not <laughs> <laughs> um Be because in this sense i have found i'm usually pretty relaxed about christianity as a thing that needs examining and one, one always hopes that that thing that is true is the thing that can bear the most attention and the most study, right? It, it's like, it, mm. you, you know, the more, it's, the more it's tested or, or challenged or 
counted or denied or, or this or that, you get to the ground of it. So it should be something that you can study intensively. We should be able to study the relationship between the sexes. We should be able to study what happened in World War II. Mm. Yes. I think the difficulty probably is the the vacuum of identity. What happens if people decide to to answer Peter Novick and say, "No, we don't want this. Uh, we don't want this to be the defining story. We don't want the Holocaust to define Jewish identity anymore." Right. Well, what do you replace it with? Because that really does require religious conversation yes. then. And then we move into the theological, which, you know, pulls us into some spheres of debate and argument that also make people feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> but it, it, it's going to require everyone to flip the meme yet yep. again and go from a very liberal and atheistic materialistic viewpoint and uh, challenge themselves and say, okay, so we've assimilated into the American society. We've assimilated into a kind of liberal, uh, liberal modern Western culture. Was that a mistake? What have we assimilated into here? Did we make the right decision? Have we, uh, have we married out of something that is, uh, is, is the true mark of our identity? You know, there, I mean, it's a very, there's a lot of really uncomfortable mm -hmm. conversations that will be had there because um, it's not just a case of saying the the Holocaust is unique. Mm -hmm. The religions themselves are going to say that they're unique. Well, and he, I mean, Peter quite rightly says you know, that things like the crucifixion have this unique character. If it's, if it's sacred... Yes. It, and we don't know how to talk about that as a culture. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And this is probably the, you know, behind all the tension. Yes. We can't talk about it as a culture. Uh, when people do attempt to have these conversations, like, you know, and I'm calling them out about it all the time, people are making comments about Jews and Judaism, and yet I can't poke back at them for being Protestants. Right. Like, <laughs> um, you kind of go into a, you, you go into a mode where you're pushing up against everybody and then realizing that we've all got our own, uh, stories that were raised in and we've adopted or that have been uh, cultivated for us that are giving us our identity. What happens when the stories are challenged? You challenge that narrative. You're challenging the identity and the existence of your own person. I mean, it's a, it's very, very difficult. It's, it's a, <sighs> I mean, it can be liberating to find out that the story you were living by which made you afraid is not in fact histor historically mm. true. Um, certainly find out men aren't, men are not bad. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, I mean like also ultimately liberating for the feminists that are still clinging onto that uh, ideology, you know, like all seven of them that are left. <laughs> men like buying things for you, men like dressing you up and paying for things right. and, you know, like the majority of them. And if they don't, you know, they're, they're broken. They're not men. <laughs> they're, they're, they're called, the cultures that have not developed this uh, treatment of women are inferior. We can make that claim straight right. away. Why? Because I grew up, I, 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 I grew up partially amongst people that had this uh, attitude to, to cultures that were, were not doing what they were doing. Uh, this isn't racial supremacy. This is just about the 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 claim that their um, their treatment of their own women is uh, superior to the people around them, uh, which I appreciated as a woman. <laughs> you you want uh, you want your men chivalrous, which is your blog. Three cheers for mm -hmm. white men. I mean, you want your uh, men chivalrous. You want your men chivalrous. You want your men that are uh, willing to fight for you like Elvis Presley, the rooster. 
uh, this isn't a victim mentality to say we're oppressed, we're oppressed. It's a wonderful thing to say, actually, we're protected. We have, uh, we have a, um, we have a culture that allows us to to move freely and to to hold our abusers to account uh, right. if if they if they do arrive. You know, the foxes are the foxes are challenged and they're they're going to be um, dealt with. I mean that that that's wonderful so th this kind of uh, headspace of getting th sunk into an eternal victimization it's very it's very sad because uh i mean I i'm just thinking at it from both angles essentially you can't fall in love with the people around you or you've got this uh feeling of always being uh prepared for for some instance of uh being ejected or rejected mm -hmm. because of uh because of something that happened to your grandparents or or their parents you know uh it it, it just seems to me that this is the 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 opposite of a of a communion the the opposite of the of the forming of of relationships to have people that are uh, in constant battle over uh, maintaining uh, victim status, mm -hmm. you know. So very, Peter very was warning about this relationships. with respect to the Holocaust, and we're trying to warn about it with respect to feminism. Mm. Yes. And... I, the danger is for women and men too. I think. Yes. For that. Yes. Everybody gets I hurt by these, these. Yeah. 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 Well, I said it with humor. You know, Ken is an ass. Mm. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't anti risk Right. But it was. It was saying, "Don't fall into doing this yourselves, boys." You know, this is the temptation too. It's like um, a subtle feminism in men because we uh in because the westerners haven't grown up in patriarchal system they're still like kind of not seeing the atmosphere for mm. what it is not realizing when they're behaving the way that they're behaving they still haven't achieved patriarchy they still haven't achieved what they want which is a masculine honor of being able to say i'm i'm a man i'm taking care of the women around right. me they're mocking the hens you still haven't achieved what you wanted you're falling into a victim status of, of mocking the very people that you should be protecting by saying that they're oppressing you for wanting to be equal to you. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like everyone's catching this. Um, well, it, it's like this opposite world of everything. Uh, and and so and yeah, saying, I'd yeah. say I had Chesterton in the middle of our, our examples because it's saying there's, there is a way out. There's got to be a way out of this. Mm. I mean, I think the victimization frame. Mm. And I mean, it, it, in that lovely, in that lovely kind of segue, say, what does it mean to say Christ has taken it all on Himself? We really need to figure out how to. Mm. Uh, that we 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 did we we've done a bit of Girardian mimesis and the scapegoating and things like that, and it, it, I think there's there's more to unpack there. But to say Christ takes on all of this for us. We need to be better at figuring out why mm. we can be persuasive. Because mm. the we we'll do it now, not now. The 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 the, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the logic of the mirror worlds that we've been caught in needs to be um, exposed, and mm. that I you know I, I I'm grateful for the fact that Peter Novick was my neighbor across the hall and taught me about mosaic mm. and that he was able better than anybody else I've known in the profession to show the way in which historians have to be doing this so that we are paying attention to the way one, the story has shifted, right? He, he showed, he showed this, um, but that he was trying to show the way in which we use these narratives as well to, to create 
our sense of reality. He's very, very good at that. Mm. And so I, I, mean, I read his that noble dream. I got there before he published this book. Um, I have my I have my signed copy here. I proved right me with a Draco Alchemicus badge and my signed copy. So you know I have it. Um, that when I say you know you've got to study history so that you don't get trapped in these kinds of things. Peter is very much why I understand that that you can get mm -hmm. inside these stories, tell them truthfully, tell them honestly, recognize what they're doing to your own sense of identity and be free of them. Mm. He did, he didn't, he mm. didn't want his fellow Jews to be using the Holocaust as their defining event. Why, mm. why, why should that be the thing that they define themselves by? It's like women defining themselves as being hated by men. Yes. Yes. It's a difficult thing to break this uh, reliance on... Uh, Hate? Perceiving yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is. Um, and when you're trying to explain it to people that are not ready or not willing to see the other side, they get very angry with you. <laughs> um, I've had that uh, experience moving moving back into the West and trying to explain to the girls that I know that grew up here without leaving it that the 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 equality myth that they're living under is insufficient. It's 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 not uh, it's not real. Uh, and even that is enough to make them enraged, even though they're unhappy with being roosterless hens. Yeah. They're, because it's a terrifying thing. Uh, and this is why I, uh, I was going off with all, all of my sandwiches about this thing, but the boys that are angry with the feminists don't seem to understand that they're mostly with women that are angry. It's uh, the rage is masking sadness. Right. And to try and explain to Western women as someone who's come out of a patriarchal society and who lived very comfortably in one, I mean, I was so happy. It was a really wonderful time of life. And then having to come back into it, I mean, I was depressed because I knew that it was wrong. I knew that I was living in a bad way. And suddenly having lost my natural station as a woman amongst men that were aware that they were responsible for taking care of me and suddenly I was alone mm -hmm. again. Not alone, but you know, independent Barbie it was horrible. So the the idea of um, explaining this to the girls, well, I mean, they get angry with you, but I know for myself because I'm a woman that the the anger masks the sadness. And what are they sad about? They're sad because if you really explain it to them, they start to understand what they've lost, what they're missing, what people aren't giving them. You tell hens that have no roosters that have never met a rooster before. We need roosters or the foxes come and they ruin everything and they have and they've destroyed everything and now we're all unhappy and miserable and, you know, no eggs, right? But they don't know what roosters are. They haven't seen them. And then they're being mocked for their response to that because ultimately women are not responsible for the fact that there are no roosters around them. The only ones that are responsible for this are the men, which can sound like a, a very entitled thing. You know, you can say, oh, well, obviously you're just entitled because you ruined your life and, you know, you're just like all of the other feminists you're complaining about. It. I've never been a feminist in my life. I've lived in a patriarchal environment where it's a given that the men are raised to know that they take care of the women. That's not entitlement. It's the proper order of a civilization uh and if those women don't have men around them no one is going to be mocking them for it nobody does because they know that there is a failure on the part of the men that need to be there taking care of them the scriptures called them widows and orphans for right. a reason so what i'm seeing is this reactionary western hatred it's like hate on hate hate cures hate but in this case, with women, it's not going to cure anything because women don't operate on hatred. We don't flourish in hatred. We flourish in love, 
We're like the church. We're not imperial machines. You know, we don't operate with the kind of imperium approach. We operate the same way as the church does. Uh, women operate on love. And if they're not offered this as a solution to their current crisis, then they're, go they're going to maintain their <sighs> adherence to a destructive narrative that they are victims and that they need to be emancipated from their male oppressors and then no one will get out of it. So, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's a very delicate thing. <laughs> you have just beautifully made the case for our Lord Rooster, <laughs> because mm -hmm. that's the argument we have to make for Christ as well, that we're without him simply victims of those demon foxes. And that mm -hmm. Christians, I mean, but, you know, the sad thing that I, I do understand about what Elie Wiesel gave the Holocaust narrative was not just that it was unique, but that God died at Auschwitz. The Jews mm -hmm. are given Aus Auschwitz as their defining identity. They're given an identity without God. Mm. And Christians yeah. have allowed them to but... live in that despair. Because we haven't told them about Christ. It's like being given a world without men. Yep. You have to have lived it in order to understand it. <laughs> so we are here to tell you about our Lord Rooster. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Our alpha. Our alpha. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> well as they say yes. like in the comments and subscribe and tell us whether we not we pulled this one off which was i the thing is i think in our mosaic arc fashion these really things all really do belong together because they're the complex of things that we aren't able to talk about that get everybody triggered and they do intersect in this kind of venn diagram sense of the victimization and the need for christ and the way in which we've created our identities with these stories. Mm. And it all comes down to yeah, whether or not you have a rooster. Do you have a rooster? I do now. You got an, you, who, what, does he have a name yet? I've got does, another one. The monarchy, the, the monarchy, the monarchy must will go off. <laughs> <laughs> he, he must not have settled in yet. So I did very, very important to have a succession, a line of succession. So yeah, we got another one. <laughs> has he, has he been, he hasn't made any sound to where we've been talking. Do you think, he hasn't. I, he's been he's been placed with the girls, the surviving girls, uh -huh. uh, to get used to each other. So we're not going to let them out for a little while because they need to be. The, the, he's there, taking care of his hens, doing... his new hens. You've given yes, him. Yes. Yes. Men need jobs. Men need jobs. Like roosters. Yeah, roosters. Roosters need jobs. So <laughs> very good. <laughs> he's been given his new job. He's in training. Right okay. Now. And now uh, we will give our training to the men of the West and understanding why they need our Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. We've got, we've gone on a little long. Did you realize that we had? Aha. Yeah. Good, good flow. Good. We need good to flow. run. <laughs> okay. Well, now. What should we talk about next time, do you think? I, I don't know yet. Oh, gee, I don't know. Some other controversial thing that we need to... We might get to Theophilus get finally. You guys realize we still haven't told you that story. <laughs> what is it, three weeks I don't Theophilus. know. We'll just, we'll just keep delaying that. Don't sell your soul to the devil. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We didn't get any super chats tonight. Oh, now I'm sad. But Casey's still watching. Imperial religion at year zero, burn incense to Caesar. Yes. Imperial religion 2023, acknowledge the supremacy of the burnt sacrifice. Oh, you want us to go there and deal with the other part of this Holocaust narrative. We wanted, we wanted, we wanted to show you the, way, the effect that it's actually having on the people 
defined by it first. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We'll be here next week with more difficult questions to consider. Let us know in the comments whether we created new problems. <laughs> 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 Bye. <laughs>